Yes, so they all start shape. One, two, three, four.
Hello, good morning. Um, a very warm welcome to day two of our conference. Uh, we will get started with this exciting session on the Clean Air flagship, a CCAC call to action. 
and uh, we're very happy to be joined by the advisor to the governor of Bangkok, uh, Mr. Juan from Vikitsred. Um, and uh, yesterday we talked about uh, not only we introduced already a little bit the idea of uh, uh, wanting to give a lot of emphasis as well to the clean air work uh, in, in the CCAC and how we can drive action forward. So that's the proposition that's on the table. We'll hear a little bit about that in a second as well from uh, from from Nathan from the Secretariat. Um, but uh, so what we have in the pipeline, and we heard yesterday as well um, how important it is uh, the important role that local governments play in all of this, and that's where. Very, very, very happy uh, to have the, the advisor to the governor of Bangkok with us. Obviously, Bangkok, uh, we, we, we've experienced a little bit uh, as well. And if we think back, uh, it was known for the traffic and a lot of action has been taken. There are a lot of things that have been happening. You, we, you will get a, a good insight as well on some of the good actions in the, in the city as well on Friday when we have our different field trips from the e-mobility elements, uh, to biogas to, um, as well the, the food bank. So there's a little bit in it for, for all these different sectors. And, uh, with that, I would like to give the floor to our, our distinguished guest. Please. Thank you very much, Swadika. To distinguished guests and panelists, thank you. My name is Pon from Vicstreth. I'm the advisor to the governor of Bangkok. Uh, I'm delighted to be here on behalf of the governor himself and to welcome you all to Bangkok and to wish you a uh, great success in the uh, this event and the clean air flagship uh, CACC call to action. So today I was just uh, to share with you briefly on the work that's being done by the Bangkok Metropolitan Administration to tackle the issue of PM 2.5 and also to push the city towards a uh, clean air. So this is a very big, import, uh, big and important issue for Bangkokians. Uh, it uh, a, tr a matter that affects us greatly, and it's also a matter that is also now much aware by the people of Bangkok. Just to give you a uh, perspective, so today the baseline of uh, PM two point five in Bangkok, so around. 0 to 30 microgram per cubic meter is from transport sector. So this happens throughout the year, 365 days a year. That's always going to be 0 to 30 micrograms per cubic meter. This is where the, uh, the green area for PM 2.5. But during the winter season, the inversion uh, matters means that it, it, it shifts up from 30 microgram to around 60, which is why the green goes to the yellow. This happens every year during the seasonal uh, matter. But then from the 60 microgram per cubic meter going up to 90, which is the red uh, alert for Bangkok, this happens from biomass burning and also the wind direction that blows into Bangkok. So this is a big issue. Uh, where the people starts to get really affected by the issue of PM 2.5 in Bangkok. So the three uh, matters that I share to you, what can we do? We can do the first part, which is the transport part, and we can do the third part, which is the open burning. The second part, which is seasonal, we kind of have to uh, just, just, you know, have to face the, the matter of the, the environment. So for transport, I think it's a big issue for Bangkok, as you can see from the traffic and the many, many cars in the city. So the first, which is the most important priority for the governor, is to encourage the use of public transport. Today, we have more and more train lines coming into to, to present in, in Bangkok. Formerly, we only had the green line, the BTS line and underground. Now we have the yellow lines, pink lines and more. But the problem in Bangkok is how to get from your home to the nearest train station and from your nearest train station to, to your workplace or place you want to go. So the first and last mile is very important. 
Today, we try to encourage the use of EV feeder system in Bangkok, which we own the fleet. And now we're doing many routes so far. So one example being uh, a large community in the Lakabang district near to the airport, Suwanapum airport. So we have a, a feeder system that links the community to the airport rail link. This carries about 20,000 people per day. So the feeder system, we also focus on uh, improving the footpath. So we have a policy called the Bangkok Trail, which we aim to improve 500 kilometers of footpath, mostly prioritizing on the footpath that link community to the nearest transport station as well, and also the improvement of bike lanes. We don't imagine Bangkok to have bike lanes throughout the city, but we want bike lanes to be strategic. So place of community near to the transport hub. So people can ride their bike to the train station, lock their bike, and then get on the main system into the city center. We also try to promote the electric vehicle ecosystem. Of course, we have to work with the national government to promote this, but the thing that BMA can do is to provide charging infrastructure. Today, we own many assets, including district offices, which are located around town. We have 50 district offices. We, we own the public parks, which these assets can be opened up for private sector or others to install or uh, come and to support with the charging infrastructure. So we, you know, we is a chicken and egg problem. What comes first, EV or the charging station? BMA can definitely help to provide space for charging stations. Also, we have vocational schools, which today we work with uh, EV Society of Thailand to have uh, courses to support retrofitting schemes for electric bikes, uh, turning from internal combustion engine uh, bikes into EV bikes, which today there are already many courses in place. And lastly, for EV, we also want to set a good example. BMA ourselves, we have a lot of fleets that are still using internal combustion engines, such as our garbage collection trucks and, you know, police, uh, civil police con control. And we are turning those, uh, we have plans to turn those into electric vehicles as well, start, starting from our garbage collection trucks. And for the biomass, this is a very difficult uh, pr problem for us in terms of that. Not only is the burning happen in Bangkok, but it also happens outside as well. And as I mentioned, with the wind direction, it also affects us. So for we start with focusing on the burning that happens in Bangkok. Today, we have 19,000 hectares of agricultural land. Around 75% is from rice farming which rice farming create rice husk, which are still today uh, burnt. So what BMA try to do is to support the local farmers with machinery to compact the rice husk. And we also to uh, provide the ecosystem as well. Once you compact the rice husk, we provide space for you to come and put it into, uh, assemble into one place and then connect with the downstream. So maybe animal feed or thermal uh, center that they, they need the rice husk to, to create energy. So we provide a kind of a solution for farmers as well to uh, give them a better options rather than just to burn the rice husk and cause PM 2.5. Of course, there are also other sources, such as industry. We have nine, 900 factories that each of the district offices check regularly, uh, twice a month that the district offices go and check into these factories. And as of uh, the seventh month since October last year, there have already been 80,000 checks uh, and is a regular and we have a lot of good corporations from the private sector. We have many crematory in the temples to the Buddhist regions. We have uh, 308 crematory and the health sanitation department are working closely with each of the temple to support, uh, to make them as, you know, um, to, to, to create a good environment from, from this. 
and also the temples use a lot of joysticks and candles which cause pm 2.5 and also indoor air pollution affecting the health of the population we also work with the many temples and now they're switching towards uh, e-candles or just not using it at all but of course with religious concerns we still have to uh, work closely with with these temples as well and the most important part and a part the BMA have a very vital role is what happens once the PM 2.5 occurs. We have to protect the health of our population. So BMA owns 12 hospitals throughout Bangkok and eight of these already have air, air pollution uh, clinics where people can come and to uh, get diagnosed and uh, meet the doctors specialized in this field. And also the health and sanitation department have programs or the, to go to communities to, to uh, work and ha have health checkups. And we also have plans to plant 1 million trees within the four years of the governor and to create many pocket parks, what we call 15 minutes park, where wherever you are in Bangkok, you can access the parks by walking within 15 minutes or 800 meters. Another, the last thing that I want to emphasize is the importance of uh, partnerships. BMA cannot do the work alone. We have many uh, collaborations with the private sector. For example, the cement uh, plant owners in Bangkok, there are nine big companies owning around 130 uh, something uh, cement plants. These are now voluntarily checking their own cement trucks more than the law required. It's a very promising start that they are, you know, and they have their own stickers as well to to prevent, you know, the polluted trucks coming into the cities. We also work with a line company, which is a, a communication company where a lot of Thai people use uh, and to have a line alert. So if uh, the PM 2.5 is high on certain days, it will be alerted to the mobile phones of our citizens just to get them to prepare or if they can work from home, do it on that day. We work with academics. The governor set up a team of so-called dust detectives where we uh, look at um, the source of, of PM 2.5 and any other things related to PM will be through this dust detective committee. And of course, with the national government, we have support from the pollution control department. We have the support from our space agency research agency to provide us with information on open burning hotspots. And also there is the master plan for PM 2.5 that we work together with multiple agencies. And lastly, the role of international organizations that we work closely and very glad to be here in the U UN. And yesterday we had a very important meeting and a bilateral meeting with the So Inchon and Gyeonggi uh, governments where we had a bilateral exchanges. So the role of international organizations is also very important to, to Bangkok. So this is a brief overview of what Bangkok is trying to do. Yes, it's still a big problem, but with the support of all the partners and to work together and a strong political will, I think we can uh, eventually reach a ideal Bangkok with clean air and healthy population. So I wish you all a great success in this event and thank you again. Thank you. Fantastic. Thank you very much for these inspiring remarks, uh, Pon From. Um, I think it shows uh, the dedication and, as you say, the political will and the partnership. I think this is really important to hold that thought. Um, with that, with no further ado, I would like to ask uh, Nathan Bookford Panel from the Secretariat to talk to us about the clean air flagship, what we have in, in the pipeline and just to say 2030 strategy of the CCAC did foresee, uh, that we could start doing such flagships. We have one already for methane which allowed us to very effectively provide services to the Global Methane Pledge uh, implementation. And we look at uh, how this clean air flagship can do something similar for all these regional corporation things that are coming up now and um, involve some, some of the plans that uh, that are out there for something that's maybe a little more global in terms of platform. And with that, uh, Nathan, um, floor is yours.
I'm setting myself up with a timer for those of you who know me. I'm not, uh, you know, that I'm not very good at sticking to time. So I'm going to try to control myself. Um, it is an absolute pleasure to be here with all of you, friends and family of Climate and Clean Air and SLCP Action. It's been way too long. Um, so as, uh, thank you, Martina, uh, for that introduction. Uh, just to uh, go a little bit deeper on the, the flagship, uh, particularly the methane flagship, I'd like to describe to you sort of what our image of, of what these flagships are based uh, in particular on the, on the one flagship that we currently have. The, the way that the flagships are imagined is that they are short-term, two- to three-year maximal efforts bringing together the collective genius and action of our broad partnership to, to elevate uh, an issue um, as much as possible and achieve a, uh, a hopefully really quite transformative change within that period of time, but also to establish the, uh, the infrastructure for sustainable change over the course of this decade and beyond. As a, as a colleague of mine who I, I don't see in the room yet, but Christina Zuka uh, once described to me as we were talking about the flagships that, uh, that we should think of this thing as an elevator. Everybody gets on the elevator together. It elevates us to a new level. Uh, and we all get off together at a higher level. I, I liked that metaphor, except it didn't seem really active and, and exciting enough. I was trying to come up with another one. I was thinking about using rocket ships, but given the fact that they've been exploding on the launch pad recently, maybe we'll stick with, uh, with the elevator metaphor. Uh, come up to me afterwards if you guys have uh, a better idea for how I can describe that. But very quickly on the methane flagship, just a little bit of the timeline. I want to lay out kind of what we can do here together. Uh, the methane flagship has really been quite exciting. In 2021, in April, uh, we uh, launched the global methane assessment, which was, I think, Drew uh, was the was the lead. Our, our esteemed uh, chair of the scientific advisory panel was the lead. And I think he will agree with me that we we were somewhat surprised <laughs> at how. Uh, at, at how that was really taken up by the global community, uh, the conclusions of that report. Um, and based on that timeline, we launched the, the GMA in May. We launched the methane flagship uh, at our ministerial on uh, November 9th. Uh, at COP26. And then immediately after that, over 100 countries came together, driven by by our ambition and, and launched the Global Methane Pledge. And I know that there are some people in this room who were part of the negotiations for the GMP, and they may disagree with me on that timeline. But I promise you, that's what happened. It was because of the flagship and our GMA, uh, and it was because of us and uh, uh, together. And uh, I think that's really quite exciting. And I think it's indicative of what we could potentially achieve. Uh, through this air pollution flagship. Uh, also, I, I'll just very quickly say, uh, as part of the GMA, we have helped, or the methane flagship, we have helped operationalize the the Global Methane Pledge as one of the core implementing agencies for it. We uh, were able to bring on uh, Drew Shindell as our special representative on methane. Uh, we had plans to send him all over the world uh, to to advocate on. Uh, um, on the behalf of methane action, but COVID had different plans. Um, so, anyways, I'm talking too long again. I, I'm terrible at sticking to time. Let me be, let me be very brief because we have an an incredible panel up here to talk about the different elements of the methane flagship proposal that we have been working on quite diligently uh, since uh, we were called upon by uh, our ministers at the last COP to begin developing the concept. Um, so. Uh, as you can see on the slide, uh, at the last COP, the ministers requested that we begin developing the concept for a air pollution flagship uh, to uh, to counterbalance or to be a, a balance uh, with and, and join with the methane flagship as a, as a major component of the activities of the CCAC. Uh, the board, um, again, uh, in March, um, reiterated the importance of the, of the flagship, um, and, and, and we began working really quite diligently, uh, bringing together or consulting with many of you in virtual meetings and bringing together a core team, um, late, late last month, uh, to, to develop the, uh, a, a more, uh, in-depth, um, outline and concept for the flagship. The goals of the flagship, as you can see here, 
I won't read them again. You can read them yourselves. But it's really about elevating this issue, creating, trying to create transformational change that's really meaningful within that short period of time, but also, as I said, creating the infrastructure uh, to support our community uh, to, to uh, increase resources and awareness and action around climate and clean air in particular. <clears throat> So there are five major components of the outline of our flagship uh, as uh, the first uh, amplify and strengthen multi-level governance, cooperation and capacity on air quality and management. Um, the way I describe it, and there are really three major elements of this. Uh, it's a, a pillar that that stands strong uh, together. So at the top of the pillar is global action. The CCAC is really quite well recognized in multiple venues through multiple really very high profile successes of, of being able to elevate at a very high level uh, particular issues around SLCPs and climate and clean air. That's something that I think we've, well, we have helped lead and have been leaders in the air pollution space. I think we can do more. Uh, and that's sort of the top of the, of the three tiers in this pillar. The middle tier is, uh, supporting the, I think the truly inspiring, um, regional uh, ambition, the political will that exists in every region of the world right now to cooperate on transboundary air pollution. I think for the first time in, in human history, every region of the world now has regional cooperation agreements, countries coming together and recognizing that they need to cooperate on uh, on transboundary air pollution. And the CCAC is really well recognized as a convener and a capacity builder. And, and we could be really quite transformative in this space. And then the bottom tier, the real foundation and the strength of the CCAC builds on our national planning and capacity work. So really ramping up our work with countries uh, to strengthen their ability and, and understanding and, and ambition to address air pollution as a component of the, the climate and clean air issue, have that filter up and support regional cooperation, support the regions together as part of a global effort. And that's, that's the, that's the idea behind this first, uh, first component of the air pollution flagship. Uh, outline. The second, strength in private sector action and air pollution. We have a representative from the private sector here. We'll be talking about um, some really exciting developments and interest from the private sector to, to begin addressing in a meaningful way uh, air pollution um, and, and, and integra in an integrated way with climate action. Martina, you don't need to look at the clock. I'm good. I'm still, I'm still within my time limit. Um, <laughs> I won't talk any further on this, but we've really done some quite exciting um, work in this space. And we actually have a session at the end of the day in this room uh, to talk a little bit more about that. Uh, third, something very near and dear to my heart, strengthening science communication and support for policy action and fill critical information gaps, especially around economic costs and benefits of clean air action. Uh, we, I think, as a community recognize that there are always going to be data and science gaps that need to be filled. However, there is enough information out uh, in this community in the world to know that we need to take action and to know the critical places where we can take action. But what we really need to be focusing on in particular is communicating that need and but also creating uh, or filling in particularly the multiple benefits, the costs of action that uh, that our policymakers, that this community, this community, uh, community can use uh, to uh, spur action back home with a broader range of stakeholders. And that begins really with this economic costs uh, and benefits analysis. And the, and the scientific advisory panel of the CCAC is leading on an economic assessment, which will, we will be presenting tomorrow uh, and will be undertaking with great urgency uh, after this, uh, this conference concludes. Number four, elevate the air quality agenda through advocacy. This again, great strength of the CCAC and of many of our partners uh, uh, to to really uh, bring together a communications plan and and elevate um, through multiple venues the issue and need of uh, particularly in uh, mobilizing resources to support um, the ambition that we've placed before us, whether it be uh, achieving the WHO standards or inter uh, interim standards or the strictest air quality guideline standards, 
Um, there are a lot of opportunities to do that. In particular, next year is the fifth anniversary of the International Day of Clean Air for Blue Skies. Uh, we see that uh, as well as other opportunities, for example, with UNEA next year and the potential that we could have a new air pollution UNEA resolution. Uh, it means that, uh, that there is a, there is a strong narrative and an opportunity for us to create, um, as a community, a messaging campaign as part of our broader work under the flagship that could really elevate this issue within the next 18 months. Finally, mobilize finance for air quality agenda. This, oh. I'm a little over time. I apologize. I'm going to steal two minutes from you guys. I, sorry, Sean. You get, okay. Thank you, Sandra. Um, I, it's, it's really quite well recognized. There just aren't enough resources, whether it be financial, human, or otherwise, uh, to, in the world mobilized currently to meet the incredible ambition that we've placed before us. There's not enough resources in the climate space, and there certainly aren't enough resources right now in the air pollution space. We, through this flagship, are committed to helping mobilize those resources, whether they be specifically for air pollution uh, management and control or through a stronger connections to mitigation and adaptation agendas in uh, in climate uh, or any of the other linked agendas. So this is a really important and critical component. I'm not sure it deserves to be number five on our list. We can we can discuss that maybe in the panel. Um, how to rank these? This might go a little higher. I'd vote two, Sean. That if you want to ask them, but so thank you all uh, for, for giving me the extra two minutes there. As I said, it is an absolute pleasure to see all of you here. Uh, I've, I've missed you all old friends and new friends. Um, it's really exciting. And I'm, I'm, I'm really uh, happy uh, to be uh, opening up for the panel uh, and listening in on, on the extended conversation about how we operationalize this flagship. So Martina, thank you. Fantastic. Thanks very much, uh, Nathan. And I will hand over now to, to Sean, Sean McGuire. Um, he's the Director of Strate Strategic Partnerships and Communication at the Clean Air Fund. And he has the, the, the role um, to take us through the, the panel discussion. And I leave it to you to introduce all the panelists as well. And thank you for all uh, for being with us. Uh, it's an amazing lineup. Um, that's all I can say. Thank you. <laughs> thank you, Martina. And thank you, Nathan, for being so speedy. Um, duly noted. Um, it's fantastic to be here um, and um, great that we have the opportunity to discuss this really important initiative that the CCAC is planning to undertake. Um, I was really struck this morning when uh, Pronfrom was talking about the number of hospitals here in Bangkok that have got specialised um, uh, air quality clinics. And it just it just reminded me of the severe health impacts that air pollution imposes upon uh, populations around the world. It's a reminder of why clean air is absolutely so so critical. Um, and of course, with the CCAC, uh, you know, the, the whole essence of the CCAC is an integrated approach that brings benefits both for health and for climate. Um, and um, as I was standing in the pouring rain last night, I was thinking climate change, hmm. And we see, you know, joking apart, we do see, you know, as we in the news and as we go about our daily lives, the impacts of climate change beginning to to, to mount around us. Um, so there is an urgency and a necessity to work harder and faster, um, and and really and really get a grip um, of the of the problems that we face. Um, and fantastic that we've got a, a panel of seven esteemed colleagues with with, with us today this morning to discuss the flagship. Um, and the work that the flagship can possibly do and how the flagship will help them and how uh, and, and what they think uh, can, can be done to improve the flagship um, as it goes into operation um, next year. Um, I'm going to um, introduce people as, as they speak. Um, and I'm going to shake things up a little bit by not running down the order. Um, I think what I'll, what I'll, I'll do is um, I will tackle different bits of the of the flagship, um, and we'll start with the sort of the kind of the regional cooperation piece. Then we'll talk about national action, um, and then we'll talk about um, cities, and then we'll talk about private sector, and we'll finish off by talking about um, global action. And um, there will be time, I hope, for a good interchange uh, between us all um, to, to discuss the flagship. So I'm going to start by um, uh, introducing Mr. Sangmin Nam, who's the Director of Environment and Development Division at UNSCAP. Um, and Sangmin, um, 
uh, you, with the flagship, the CCAC says it wants to help strengthen regional cooperation. Um, and now, you obviously have been at the heart of launching uh, the Asia-Pacific Regional Action Programme on Air Pollution, quite a significant initiative for the region. Um, so how do you think this will help advance air quality in the region? Thank you, Sean. Uh, let me first borrow the language of the word from uh, Nitan. Uh, Nathan, uh, he said uh, it is fr in the first time in the human history, so all regions have uh, their own action program on air pollution. So I didn't know this kind of historical implication for having our own regional program on action, uh, regional action program on air pollution. So, you know, I, I was looking at this uh, uh, outline of a flagship clean air flagship. Certainly, I'm really uh, excited uh, to see that it's going to strength, focus on supporting regional and sub-regional cooperation. Indeed, uh, you know, despite the fact that Asia Pacific is the really global epicenter of air pollution, but uh, we were really behind the other regions for creating its own action program. But we were able to develop and facilitate intergovernmental process because of a global level awareness on the impact, health impact of air pollution. And then another important uh, element for uh, changing the attitude of our member state was certainly people's access to real-time air pollution data without this kind of political pressure. So they were able to uh, come up with a you know, they were more open to regional or sub-regional cooperation. And in that regard, so this global level support uh, uh, for strengthening regional and sub-regional cooperation would be very important for, you know, driving force to to really further support our member state. In addition, I would like to highlight another point that is a strengthening capacity at all levels and also strengthen private sector action and science communication and global and air quality agenda through advocacy. Those are four five elements that will be also directly supporting our regional action. So current uh, components of our regional program, uh, we have uh, five elements. One is um, air quality management. Uh, second one is air quality monitoring and data sharing. And third one is um, exchanging best of practice. Fourth one is capacity building and technical support. And then the last point, uh, the fifth one is a commitment to more longer term multilateral cooperation. So all of our uh, action components uh, have a direct implication for strengthening capacity whether in air quality management or monitoring or uh, developing policies and strengthening their technical measures. So in that regard, the flagship would really support the, you know, our planned work on the regional action program. And with regard to science communication mentioned in the uh, outline, uh, the main purpose of this uh, action program is to facilitate, to promote science-based and policy-oriented cooperation. So in that regard, the action program also identifies number of actions involving academic community research institutions to really strengthen our scientific basis and then utilize that kind of scientific assessment for policy development. So in that, so I, I see a direct connection with that. Also, in terms of a modality and private sector, uh, in a way to facilitate technology development, uh, the action program also identify uh, the role of a private sector and then how we should engage private sector to, to, you know, it's not, the action program is not just a program for uh, government institutions, government agencies, but it is also action program for multi stakeholder and also private sector. So hopefully, you know, this kind of a global level flagship uh, report uh, would be, uh, could serve a really useful reference for us to advance our own agenda because uh, despite the, 
the fact that we have an action program, but we don't have a, a strong institutional basis for implementing this. So, which means we have to really count on uh, these uh, recommendations and evidences from global level as well as uh, sub regional level. So, I look forward to you know, making our own contribution to this process and then receiving uh, support from this collection. Thank you. Thank you, Simon. That's really interesting and useful to hear. Um, I was particularly struck by you talking about how um, the, the regional action plan um, in Asia Pacific has a commitment to uh, longer term multilateral cooperation. And I wanted to um, ask Beatrice Cardenas, who's the air quality director from the World Resources Institute um, and who is based in Mexico City, um, uh, about her experiences in Latin America and the Caribbean. Um, where there have been uh, previous examples of, of regional cooperation. And I was wondering whether, uh, Beatrice, you see um, what you have learned from, from that as to what it takes to, to drive regional cooperation. Um, and Sangmin has talked about how the flagship could possibly, could possibly help him in his efforts in this region. Um, uh, does the flagship have a bearing um, on the work that, that you see happening in, in Latin America and the Caribbean? Thank you, uh, Sean. Yes, definitely. Um, I will say that uh, starting from, from Latin America, um, there, there has been, I mean, Sergio was presenting yesterday about the regional effort and that uh, some national, I mean, national at national level. I will say that there is a lot going on at the city level and a lot of cooperation that definitely a flagship program could help. And we are talking about cooperation and cooperation, not only, I mean, in this case, uh, probably representatives of some city governments. We, yesterday, we, we learned a lot and very inspiring. And that's something that we have seen that when, uh, when cities share either same airshed or when they share uh, similar sources or similar economic and, and social conditions, they, they like to know how other cities are doing. So that's part of the cooperation, exchanging ideas, getting inspired finding solutions that may be applying for them. And that's something that we have seen in this uh, um, in this cooperation in Latin America. I will say that one example is the com are the communities of practice that we bring together some cities to share what they are doing. We link them as well with some uh, uh, experts from the scientific community, from technical experts. We hope to have some participation very soon also with the private sector and, and see some insp inspired projects that can be done. So that's something that can be that, that I think that that's an example. I will say that we have also seen that in addition to to have this regional cooperation, let's say Latin America and, and, and the Caribbean, what we start seeing is that there's a lot of similarities and some cooperation interregional. And that's how we started also to link uh, this, uh, again, the communities of practice in Latin America with Africa. And we found that, wow, there is a lot of similarities, some differences, of course, but some of the projects uh, that have been working in one city or in one region could be applied or at least learn and do and, and not spend so many years as other cities have done. And now we are also trying to link uh, the community of practice Southeast Asia. So that, uh, by the way, is a small advertising. We are presented that on Thursday with the support of the State Department from the U.S. So, and the first community of practice Latin America and, and Africa was has been supported by, uh, by the Cleaner Fund. So I think that there are a lot of experiences. Something that we think that uh, that we are seeing that a flagship like this one could help is cooperation. I mean, there's already a lot of cooperation. We see that uh, over the yesterday, and we will see that the following days and over the last years of the CCAC, this cooperation among scientific, the scientific community from different um, areas. Uh, can we expand that and to uh, support or in our um, make this cooperation more uh, with local scientists. Uh, we also are seeing that there is a need of more cooperation among uh, some NGOs, international as well as local. Sometimes we are doing uh, a lot of work in one country, in one city, in one region, but we do not coordinate enough. We do not collaborate a lot. So that's a big opportunity. I was thinking of the analogy that uh, Nathan was doing. So maybe we are trying to get all of us uh, on the top of the hill. And some of us are actually in that hill, but not 
collaborating, not talking unless, and this, this opportunity is a great opportunity. What you are doing? Oh, have you met this person? Oh, can we just compare? So that's something that a flagship like this could do. Um, uh, getting into the top faster and maybe, uh, in an elevator or some, sometimes in another type of, uh, way, but, but really coordinating because we need to do this as much as, as, as faster. And also how we are all talking about integrating air quality and climate. We all want to do that. But uh, I think we have to be honest enough that we are not getting there. How can we do it in a more uh, efficient and more convincing way? Um, and I think that the flagship could do that as well. So we have a lot of experiences. Um, and I think that uh, hopefully next year or in the following months, we can even share more, more of these experiences. Thank you. Thank you, Beatrice. That was really interesting. Thank you. Um, so I, th I think we've talked a little bit about the, the regional cooperation aspect that the, the flagship wants to support. Now I'd like to turn our attention to um, the national action um, piece that the flagship um, also wants to encourage. Um, um, and where, uh, as, as, as Beatrice says, we, we sometimes miss the mark on doing integrated um, air quality and, and climate planning. So I wanted to turn to Ms. Aisha Mohammed Al Abduli, who's the director of the Green Development and Environment Affairs Department of the, of the United Arab Emirates, and ask her, um, uh, Aisha, U UAE has got a national air quality strategy. I'm just wondering um, if, you, if how that helps guide your mitigation strategy and whether there's aspects of that that you're feeding into your NDCs, for example. So good morning, everyone. Thank you, Sean, for, for uh, this question. And uh, thank you actually for being part of uh, this interesting panel. Uh, we are happy and pleased to share with you our experience when it comes to developing national plans and strategies for air quality, especially with the mitigation and the adaptation measures that we can uh, have. And uh, at the end of my um, intervention or respond, I will clarify a point related to the integration with the uh, NDC and how that is feeding the NDC. So the development of our national uh, air quality strategy or what we called it air, national air quality agenda was actually initiated following a comprehensive air quality pollutants emissions inventory conducted in the United Arab Emirates. And this inventory played a crucial role in identifying the primary sources of pollution, especially through key category uh, assessment. And we found from this inventory uh, that the prioritization of initiatives incorporated into our national agenda, uh, the governments often face a common challenge in managing air quality. And this is uh, because it is a cross-sectoral issue typically handled by a single department within the environmental authorities at our country. However, effective mitigation requires the participation and collaboration of multiple parties and sectors across the government, and that include the energy sector, industry, waste, agriculture, health, education, and also more. So the main objective of this agenda or the strategy was actually to lead and coordinate the actions among federal and local institutions to ensure efficient monitoring management of air uh, quality and also to have effective pollution mitigation. So our strategy was developed collaboratively with inputs from various federal and local authorities representing different sectors. And in this, I would like to really emphasize the importance of engaging your stakeholders from the beginning if you want your strategy to be implemented. Otherwise, if you just make it uh, in uh, isolation from them, then make sure or be, be sure that the strategy will not be successfully implemented. So the most or the key success factor for any successful implementation of strategy is actually to have the buy-in of this relative stakeholders or the relevant stakeholders, sorry, from the beginning. So that really um, help us in having, you know, the um, primary emitting sectors for both air quality pollutants and greenhouse emissions. And the development of the agenda coincided with the preparation of uh, UAE nationally determined contribution. Uh, 
resulting in significant alignment between air quality mitigation initiatives and those included in the NDC. An important um, uh, observation was made uh, is that stakeholders who are not typically involved in air quality matters may have a good understanding of greenhouse gas emissions reduction, but may be less aware of the air quality co-benefits of their climate actions. So the agenda collected numerous initiatives that were already in progress on the ground and highlighted the positive impacts they had on the air quality. Uh, during the target setting for the NDC uh, and the preparation of the air quality pollutants inventory, we recognize the importance or there is an important opportunity actually for integration requirement and the key stakeholders involved between both the air quality uh, inventory and the greenhouse gases inventory. So consequently, a significant step was taken actually to incorporate the air quality emissions quantification alongside the UNFCCC required the greenhouse gas inventory. This integration allows for more efficient utilization of resources and demonstrate the interconnection between both air pollution and climate action. Yesterday, we had a very interesting uh, discussion with the Secretariat, and uh, uh, we thought that it is really important that we come up with uh, maybe a focused group or a task force that can work together on how we can do this integration between both inventory. Uh, United Arab Emirates is really willing to support the establishment of such a task force and a, a focused group. Uh, we are willing to share our experience because we do it or we did it the hard way, as, as you can uh, see. So uh, we were going through several challenges actually in having this integration, especially that I'm representing uh, in the government, the Ministry of Climate Change and Environment, and we as a national federal entity, we don't own the data. So the data for both the air pollutants and the greenhouse gases are owned by other uh, entities and other stakeholders. And it's really important to bring them all together on one table and to make them or to convince them actually and to encourage them to give us this data and share it according to the requirement of the international commitment that we have. So we are willing to have such, uh, to support such an establishment of this group. And uh, we are open to share our experience with everyone in this room who is uh, interesting and in knowing more about our experience. Thank you. Thank you, Aisha. Absolutely fascinating uh, account of, of the reality of trying to make integrated planning work with um, with the sort of institutional uh, hurdles and barriers that that, that can be faced uh, ins inside a country and and what needs to be done to to overcome them. Um, so, you know, I think I think your your suggestion of, of, of a task force is, is no doubt one that the colleagues at CCAC will will will, will explore further. And it's, it's exactly the kind of initiative that the flagship is is going to help um, um, drive forward. Um, so um, let's build on that a little bit and look at another example of of national um, action planning. I wanted to turn to Mr. Thiv Sofiarith from the General Directorate of Environmental Protection at the Ministry of Environment in Cambodia. Um, and in, uh, in particular, um, ask you, Thiv, uh, about um, the the how the your clean air uh, plan um, led to changes in uh, national fuel standards um, and the benefits that that had as a, as a practical example of, of, of action that can be taken. Thank you, Chair. Uh, yes, uh, we believe that uh, Cambodia Clean Air Plan could help to improve the national fuel uh, quality standard. Because uh, a Clean Air Plan is uh, we uh, set up with the clear evidence and uh, good data on air quality and air pollution source. Uh, moreover, Clean Air Plan have combined the strong tool of the government regulation. Uh, such as uh, number one is the government uh, circular on measure to prevent the, and reduce the ambient air pollution. This circular uh, was issued in uh, 2020 and uh, 
develop to support the government goal on reducing air pollution in Cambodia uh, for reflecting the recent increase of the risk of health of pollution. In uh, the circular content uh, strategic uh, measurement on reducing air pollution from major source and activity and led to increase of the concentration of particulate matter, including the release of emission from industrial, the use of diesel power, power vehicle and other combustion fuel. Uh, wildfire, forest fire, yard burn, garbage burn, open field burning of solid waste, wasteland field and construction site. So in this uh, secular, uh, secular, we have seven strategic measures to, uh, to uh, reduce the air pollution. I just highlight two uh, strategic that related uh, to the fuel quality and uh, emission standard. Number one is uh, quality management of high sulfur content on fuel, focus on promoting the implementation of sulfur standard level which contain in fuel for compliance with the Euro standard, Euro 3, Euro 4, and Euro 5, respectively. And number two is uh, the administration for air pollutant emission from vehicle. Focus on promoting the implementation of the emission standard on air pollutant from vehicle for compliance with Euro standard also. Uh, uh, with Euro 4, Euro 5, and Euro 6. Uh, number two of uh, our uh, uh, regulation is sub-degree on control of air pollution and noise disturbance. This sub-degree we established uh, in year 2000 and uh, with purpose to protect the environment quality and public health from air pollution and noise pollution through uh, monitoring curb and mitigation activity. This degree uh, apply to all movable source and immovable source of air pollution. In the sub degree include air emission standard, ambient air quality standard, fuel quality standard, and so on. And uh, number three of uh, our regulation is Cambodia Climate Change Strategic Plan. 2014-2023. The government strategic uh, document is Cambodia Climate Change Strategic Plan 2014-2023 was issued in 2013. This document was developed with the version of Cambodia development toward a green low carbon, climate resilient, equitable, sustainable, and knowledge-based society. And number four of our uh, regulation is Cambodia's update nationally, nationally determined contribution. The government strategic document is Cambodia's update nationally determined contribution was issued in 2020. This document was developed to present Cambodia's commitment and need for next decade in order to realize her vision of a low carbon and resilient society. This strategic document showcases her progress in climate policy and put forward mitigation target and adaptation action consistent with the national circumstance of Cambodia. <laughs> These are the main existing government regulation and policy to support our goal uh, to comply with the uh, fuel quality and uh, emission uh, standard. Uh, moreover, uh, additional essential clean air measures are also analyzed to visualize the potential emission reduction as for policy recommendation. However, it is not enough. We still need more activity to support the full implementation such as capacity building on how to inspect the fuel quality and vehicle emission testing and other activity. Thank you.
Thank you, Thiv. Um, uh, very interesting to hear um, of the mix of sort of regulation and control measures um, and, and overall planning that you've used uh, to try to tackle your, your air pollution problems. Um, interesting also that you talked about the need for capacity building. Um, and I'm going to switch now to uh, to cities, um, which is another level um, of where we've heard from Beatrice um, that uh, cities can learn from each other there's a, and there's a lot of sort of peer-to-peer -peer support available. Um, but I wanted to talk, turn to Mr. Jose Edgardo Gomez um, from the Quezon City Government in the Philippines. Um, and Jed, you... Um, uh, you, you've you've heard about the kind of the need to strengthen capacity, um, and I was wondering um, what what kind of support does a city like like Quezon City City need, and what are the governance challenges that that you face in going about doing your work um, on air quality uh, in a city within a, within a within within the federal structure in a country like the Philippines? Okay. Thank you, Sean, and uh, good morning, everyone. Um, in response to that question, I would uh, I have three points actually, and I would like to start off with the idea of um, of scientific cooperation. That's point number three on your flagship. Um, I I think the the one of sorry, we're sharing microphones here. Um, one of the uh, more important points is the government must encourage initiative and talent and uh, and good ideas from everywhere. And fortunately, um, despite its imperfections, the Philippines socio-politically has an environment that has a very uh, lively NGO and civil society landscape. And given that, I think it's it's uh, it's an opportunity for us to be able to tap um, the academe and those who know the hard science on on clean air in order to inform and to guide the um, the initiatives and activities of government. Um, I would I would like to take as a brief example my my own experience. I I had been working for nearly two decades with the academe until I got a phone call last year, and they asked me, "Would you like to join the team of the mayor?" And they said, "Budget is not a problem, staff is not a problem, and making decisions is not going to be a problem because you're going to be fairly high up." And of course, those of you in the academe would know that that's an opportunity that one should not pass up. And and so. Uh, I get to work with people who are, who are doing a lot of uh, so problem solving on the ground, but who are perhaps not used to write, to reading and writing scientific journal articles. And so I think the partnership works out very well in, in that respect. Um, another point here is that uh, in the Philippines, the, the cities or the local governments are under a little bit more pressure to innovate because the terms of the elected officials are much shorter. So they have to produce more. And, and they have to show that, uh, they have to show good results because that will re lead to re-election. And so there are political gains for this. Um, my second point on, um, which, which, uh, relates to capacity building is, um, is, uh, touches on your metaphor, on the metaphor of Nathan on, on elevators. We might not all be on the same elevator, but we might be on different elevators. I think what's important is that, we're all headed upwards to, to clean air and blue skies. Um, having said that, I, I think what we need to understand here is that there's a uh, there's an entire spectrum of, of participation, and that's where capacity building comes in for, for local governments and national governments. In the Philippines, for example, there are cities uh, like, like Quezon City, which are already quite capable and when they do ask for help uh, we we get the likes of C40 or clean air asia we get international level assistance and and we 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 were told that eventually we will have to stand our, on our own and definitely we do want to stand on our own when it comes to to doing something about clean air management as well as to lead other cities on the other hand there are cities that are uh, not going to be able to do this for a long time. And so, so they need a little bit more of, uh, of hand-holding. They need a little bit more of assistance that might possibly stretch um, several years or, or even several decades. But, but the point is it's, it's important for everyone to, be, to, to have an idea that this is important and, uh, and, and we're all heading in the same direction. Now, I think there is no fear that the elevator might fly off somewhere else because the nature of the problem um, compels interlevel and intergovernmental co uh, cooperation. 
Um, while we might stop the sources locally, uh, there are always issues of transboundary um, um, uh, air pollution. And, and so we, we really can't escape from that. Uh, there will be some cooperation and, and it, it's likely it's better if it's guided between local governments and between the local and the national. Um, and finally, on my last point, uh, I'd like to touch on the idea of the flagship uh, the, as a flagship effort, uh, a CCAC flagship effort. Um, I think it's important uh, from the point of view of CCAC as well as 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 the governments that it works with that um, th there is a need to steer the level of discussion if necessary and to expand awareness. Uh, depending on which sector of society one is trying to recruit. Why do I say this? Um, because uh, except for scientists, it is somewhat difficult to get people excited about clean air per se, um, which is something invisible to, your, to, to most people's eyes. But it is much easier to get them excited about parks, about green open spaces where their children can play, and about being healthy and not having to go to the hospital in in your old age. And I think that's something that 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 local governments know how to do how to do very well. So uh, there is a there is an opportunity really for for um, streamlining that sort of uh, communication and making sure everybody is uh, speaking the same language, so to speak. Yeah. Thank you very much. Thank you, Jed. And yes, fascinating last point about the need to uh, speak in language that um, that is 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 understandable and relevant to to local communities and, and attractive to them. Um, I, I'm fascinated to hear that cities in the Philippines are under pressure to innovate and show good results to get elected. Um, where I come from, um, uh, cities sometimes freeze and don't do anything for fear of not getting re-elected. Um, so you almost have the the, the, the the challenge turned on its head. Uh, trying to encourage uh, cities in the UK to take bolder action um, is very difficult because uh, because uh, city leaders are fearful of of, of losing votes. Um, I, I think it's time now to change to change focus and turn to uh, the private sector and the potential role that the private sector can play in um, in uh, securing uh, clean air. Obviously, we know uh, private sector drives a lot of economic activity, and much economic activity can be polluting. Um, but we we do also know that um, uh, some private sector actors are beginning to realise um, that they have a role to play in combating climate change and, and protecting the environment generally. Um, and there's there's beginning to be um, some awareness among some members of the private sector that they they have a role um, in in combating air pollution as well. So I wanted to turn to. Um, Ms. Musumi Batch, who's the Vice President of Sustainability at SEMI, and SEMI is the uh, trade association for the semiconductor industry. Um, uh, Musumi, I wanted to ask you, uh, what do you think is the um, the role of companies um, in working to tackle air, air quality and what should their ambition be? Thank you, Sean. Um, and I'm super excited to be amongst experts and veterans in air quality. Um, I have to say that uh, the private sector I represent uh, which is the Semiconductor uh, uh, Trade Association, which is a consortium of uh, 2,500 um, semiconductor com companies with a wide reach of 1.3 million members, is very early on the journey. Um, so what I would like to uh, start with is actually theme it on what Jed just uh, talked about, the very um, entertaining visuals as well as the... Uh, uh, visual references, uh, as well as the narrative to stay, to speak the language that, um, the other party you're trying to convince, uh, can understand. So I'll theme that on that conversation. Um, and, uh, also provide a little bit of background of the industry that I represent. Um, so for those of you that are not familiar with this industry, the semiconductors, um, are the chips that provide solutions to multiple industries, such as medical, defense, banking, to name a few. And they also provide solutions to sustainability initiatives. Well, that's the, the good news. The bad news is we also have a large carbon footprint, which comes about from the manufacturing. And last year at COP27, we launched the first ever climate consortium for our industry. And so to be rather candid, our uh, journey on decarbonizing the, uh, the uh, uh, sector has just uh, started. 
So, Sean, in terms of uh, being able to address the air quality, um, I just have to level set that the private sector uh, has to start with awareness. Um, and some of you here have already gone through that journey, so I, I believe I'm in great company. And so my plan is to leverage on our climate action and to build this up. Uh, we saw this from Nathan's opening um, on strengthening the link on climate agenda. And I think all of my fellow panelists have make, made reference to that as well. So that's definitely one of the, the, the key um, initiatives that will help us get the conversation going. Um, and then the and then, um, argument that I'm planning to anchor uh, this uh, initiative on is the co-benefits of the GHG reduction work that is already part of our semiconductor climate consortium. Um, so I'm going to try and emphasize on three uh, key points, uh, some of which I'm really pleased to see have been uh, reiterated here several times. It's the strong links between GHG and air pollutant emissions in terms of the sources and the um, existing GAG mitigation plans. And so hence, uh, highlighting the synergies in the work that has already started with the Climate Consortium. So I'd like to quote from Aisha over here, who said uh, that professionals may be more aware of the GAG reduction um, and the positive impact. Uh, they uh, may be more aware of GAG reduction, but less aware of the positive impact that they have on air quality. For sure, that is true of the rep of the industry that I'm representing. And I'm hoping that um, I can uh, help to establish that uh, link and take that conversation further. The second point is in reference to the inventories associated on both sides. So current actions to reduce GHG emissions have already had an impact uh, in reducing um, air pollutant. Unfortunately, some of the large private sector companies that are making amazing strides in terms of sustainability efforts and reducing their uh, emission footprint are not aware of what that looks like. So um, supporting this industry to build those in inventory side by side and providing that knowledge would be uh, the second important step to get it there. Um, and as you would know, scientists like numbers. So just being able to see those numbers would be a great impetus for uh, my industry. Um, and then the last one is in terms of upcoming policy changes. Uh, this will definitely impact the private sector in the near future. Example is the CSRD reporting. Businesses which have operations in Europe uh, are, sustain uh, are uh, substantial trade with Europe. Um, have less than a year to get ready for uh, reporting on air pollution. So by collaborating with the community over here, uh, hopefully we will have the resources available to support our private sector companies with their January 2024 filing. Um, and I'd like to wrap by um, uh, by coding that, by mentioning that this is not lost on me, that this is hard work. And I also heard that uh, we have colleagues over here that are willing to help with the initiatives that we talked about. So I'm looking forward to getting some of that help from my uh, fellow panelists and folks in the audience. Thank you. Back to you, Sean. Thank you, Masumi. And, uh, and um, uh, it's very interesting, your final point that you know regulation is coming. Um, uh, so companies need to prepare, but also uh, interesting that even though you are early on the journey, there are some uh, some front pioneers and some front runners that are beginning to get this work underway. And that's obviously something that we want to encourage. So I wanted to um, invite our last speaker to speak specifically to um, uh, another level of, of cooperation and engagement, which the flagship uh, wants to support, which is the, the global level. Um, um, so, um, turning now to Rob King, who's the uh, Rob Wing, who's the Chief for Environment and Trade at the U.S. Department of State. Uh, Rob, um, what do you think needs to happen at the global level, and how can the flagship support that? Thank you so much. Um, and again, I'm Rob Wing. I, I'm actually the Deputy Director of the Office of Environmental Quality. I got a promotion, so super excited about that. And I'm, I'm from the United from the U.S. Department of State. Well, first, let me thank the CEC and UNEP for inviting me to be on this panel. It really is such a pleasure and honor as we launch the Clean Air flagship. 
I also really want to thank my fellow panelists. You all inspire me and humble me with your knowledge and expertise. And I really have, I think this has been a great panel because we've covered everything from the really local level and what people are doing in the local level, at the national level, at the regional level. And now I'm going to talk a little bit about the global level. Um, so what can we do to, to do more to go um, galvanize global action to combat air pollution? And I think the, the CEC flagship program is the Clean Air flagship program is really an amazing start. I mean, it's it's that elevator that is going up very fast, or maybe it is a rocket ship that doesn't that doesn't um, doesn't explode and really ends up in the atmosphere um, doing really great things. Um, and so I think that's, a, you know, just an incredibly good start. And it's really is an honor to be here for that. Um, but I do think we need to do more. I think it's, it's, it really is time to, um, to really, you know, yesterday I was struck, um, during one of the panel discussions by our delegate from Kenya who talked about Africa and that they're not really being a platform for regional discussions in Africa. And, and we learned later that there is sort of a nascent attempt to start a platform there. But why is there not a platform there? Why are there still gaps? I mean, air quality is, um, the leading, let me get it right. Um, is the leading environmental risk factor for human health. What, you know, what is this statistic? More people die a year from exposure to air pollution than HIV, malaria, and tuberculosis combined. And yet, air quality has not captured global attention. Why not? We need to change that. How do we change that? Um, I think the, the air quality flagship program is, is going to change that, but I think we can even do more. Um, as Beatrice said, we need everybody talking and acting. There are already a number of organizations out there working to do this in certain areas on certain issues. We've heard a lot of that. We heard a lot about them yesterday. We need, we need to bring all of these folks to get together and, and get them sharing and pushing each other to do even, to be even more ambitious. We need to foster and build the, these new regional initiatives or, you know, either foster them or build new regional initiatives, including by looking at the ones that work. Like the, the, the air pollution, the long, long range transbarrier air pollution convention in the UN East E region. That's a long standing air convention that has, that has had amazing success stories. And we need to look at that and those success stories and see how we can replicate it. And, you know, we need to foster, foster the new SCAP regional framework, um, and, and replicate that in other regions as well and learn those lessons. Um, we need to figure out where the gaps are. I again cite Africa, and and if there is a gap in a, in Af Africa, we need to take lessons learned, and we need to to build these regional programs. Um, we really need to jumpstart. Um, I heard a great idea yesterday from a C CCAC colleague. Maybe we identify champion countries in regions with nascent regional platforms who can really push. Um, the ambition of those countries and push the region to, to do more on air quality. Um, we also, and I, a number of people have said this, we need to engage with the development banks and figure out financing. We've heard from the Asia Development Bank yesterday that they are ready to talk and do more. I know on good authority that the World Bank has ideas for financing. We need to talk to them and bring them into our circle. Um, and we need a global convener who can bring us all together to share information and technology and spur more ambition. Um, we really need somebody who can who can sort of bring all of the regional organizations together, all of that regional work together and, you know, make it make it, you know, sort of coherent and make it provide a platform for for us to learn from each other from the different regions. Um, I, along with that, I think we need a global knowledge and training platform we, that we can all easily access and where we can we can you know, it can be a, a, a place, uh, a place where we can find all of the lessons learned and guidance. So related to all that, the United States is um, planning to propose an air quality resolution at the next UNEA. I've said that before. I said that at our, one of our meetings in Ulaanbaatar, but we're, 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 we're making progress on that. Um, we want to capture a lot of ideas that we've heard here. Um, we wanted to build on UNEA, the UNEA resolutions 1, 7 and 3, 8. And bring all of these threads that we've talked about together today, and and really we want to spur action. Um, we welcome co-sponsors. We are still in early stages, but it's never er too early to talk and get ideas on the table. So, so that's a very concrete thing that I think we can do. Um, you know, in the global stage, we really need to elevate this as a 
as a global issue. So again, my name is Rob Wing. I'm at the United States Department of State. My email address is wingrd at state.gov. I'm here all week. Please seek me out if you're interested in joining us and developing the resolution so we can really start sort of pushing this and bringing it all together and elevating this issue on the global stage. I think it's really important. Thank you. Thank you, Rob, and congratulations on your your promotion. And I apologise that that got missed. Um, uh, I wanted to follow up now. We've got about kind of 10, 15 minutes left. Um, so I, I think the, probably the most efficient thing for me to do is just to sort of throw some questions at a couple of people and 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 see if we can pick up on a few things that that we haven't managed to cover. Uh, Rob, I was going to start with you. Um, fantastic that the US is planning to propose this AQ resolution. I think a lot of us are hopeful that that will be an, an, an energizing um, um, uh, activity and development and that you will be able to get some strong co-sponsors uh, from it from with a di diversity of geographical backing um, for that resolution. Um, you 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 picked up on the question of financing and and people will have noticed that we don't have a financing expert on on the panel um and i'm not sure there's a, there is anybody from the world bank attending the conference which is a bit of a shame if it if that is the case um because you know we are looking for some leadership from some of these organizations um on, on this um so i was going to ask you rob um how do you think we can encourage the banks and in particular the world bank to take a bit more leadership and, and show a bit more leadership and, and not and not constantly tell us that well you know we're waiting for countries to tell us what to do uh, because you know that's a kind of an argument of negative circularity right that's a really good question um and I'm not sure I have a really great answer, um, but I think this is a start. I think, you know, we we did hear, I, I missed it, at, unfortunately, because I was still um, traveling here to Bangkok. But I, I heard yesterday that the um, the representative from the Asia Development Bank talked a little bit about this and, and has some ideas. So I think we need to go and we need to call them on it and say, let's talk about those ideas. Let's figure out how this works. And then I think, and I've also heard that the World Bank is also very interested in these issues as well. And I think sometimes they just need a little push. They need some someone to show interest. Um, and if we could work together, if we could pull together, you know, sort of a coalition or a collection of, of countries who are interested to um, to start a conversation, then I think that that's at least a start. Um, and I, and I, you know, that I think we, I also think we need to, uh, uh, some people at the bank understand this, but um, it is such an, it, air, air pollution is such a global scourge, you know, I mean, people are dying from air pollution every day. And, you know, when you tell the stories, um, it really resonates. Um, and that, so I think we need to tell those stories with the banks. We also probably need to go to our country representatives on the banks and let them know that this is a, is a priority. And so that's going to be a whole internal process of, of its own. But um, I think that's a, that's another avenue. And you just we need to come at it from every angle we can. Also, we need to go to our finance ministries or, you know, the, you know, like for the, in the U.S., the Treasury and, you know, make sure that they have the talking points and that they're all this is also on their agendas because they sometimes have more influence um now is a really good time too there's as i understand it and i'm not an expert on the bank but they're starting this evolution process and um so i think now is the time to sort of identify these issues as important and figure out how how we can how they can become you know how how the, even there we can elevate air air pollution issues um, in, in those forums. Cause I don't, I don't think it's that hard. I mean, it's concessional funding. It's, you know, gar loan guarantees. It's things like that, that I think will really go a long way. So I'm not, again, I'm not an expert on, on the, on the, on the banks, but those are some ideas anyway. Thank you. Great. Thanks, Rob. I think those are, those are very helpful suggestions, which, um, uh, we can, we can try and, and follow up on. And, and I think uh, related to finance, um, one of the key points that the flagship makes is that we haven't done as good a job as we should have, um, at making the economic case around the, the why tackling air quality matters. I mean, obviously it matters for human health, uh, you know, and so you've got that human, human argument. But, um, you know, for hard-headed economists, uh, you, you also need to put things in numbers. So how do we make the, how do we make the, um, that, that economic case more strongly? You know, Rob is going to 
<laughs> jump right back in, yeah, but I do sorry, want to yeah, come back uh, to Sang Min as well and yeah. ask, see whether he has uh, some thoughts on that too. Yeah, no, sorry, I don't mean to, to but there is a, there is an amazing case to make. You know, in the U.S., our our air quality improved um, seventy percent, I think, since we we I'm you know don't quote me on the statistics, but the air quality dramatically improved. You know, after entry into force of the Clean Air Act in the U.S., and our an economy grew by three hundred percent. I mean, and so it is. There is no question that it's a win-win situation. If you really bring in the economists and you do the cost-benefit analysis, every time the the cost-benefit analysis shows that you know, air, improving air quality and and cutting cutting down on air pollution is is a good economic decision. I mean, I think it's. There's not. It's not even close. I mean, I think the the benefits of doing that outweigh the cost. Sometimes, like ninety ten or something. I mean, so and we have some. We have some really good. We have a, a program called BenMap that that EPA and maybe my EPA colleagues can talk more about it. But it's a really great um, tool that we've used with other governments to have them do cost benefit analysis of 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 air pollution con- air pollution regulation and air pollution control and. And I think it really is a great tool that is out there that does help demonstrate, make this argument. Great. Thank, thanks, Rob. Um, Sangmin, do you have some thoughts on how we can make the economic case better, particularly in, in, in the Asia region? Uh, uh, you know, in this meeting yesterday, today, we are discussing how to integrate climate and clean air agenda. And so now we have a quite a different context uh, with regard to our action on climate, I mean, clean air. So from ESCA member state, we have more than 80% of countries, including here, Cambodia, announced their commitment to carbon neutrality by 2050 or 2060. And then, so we have a Bangkok metropolitan area. So they are planning to replace current uh, you know, city bus, uh, about the 50 of a city bus by EV in next two years time. And then yesterday we have a, we had a Mongolian minister. So Ulaanbaatar city is also planning to replace its, uh, you know, vehicles about the 70,000, 700,000 by EV, 30% of all the vehicles by EV in next few years. So there is a great initiative from, uh, countries for low carbon pathways. So this pure switch and then electric vehicles and also energy efficiency, which have a direct core benefit for clean air action. And then for today, the speaker from Bangkok metropolitan area, he also highlighted the impact of biomass burning on air quality of Bangkok. Uh, here, so Thailand is uh, planning to uh, expand its carbon sequestration capacity by 120,000 uh, ton per year. And then Cambodia, uh, so their nature-based solution to the carbon neutrality goal is expand their carbon sequestration capacity by 50 million ton per year. So which means in order to achieve that, they have to regulate biomass burning. Otherwise, it's not possible to achieve the uh, NDC goal and then also uh, carbon neutrality goals. So we have to bring the, uh, this climate agenda into clean air, clean, clean air action agenda. So it will really help us to convince countries to invest more in addressing both climate and clean air action. And so by integrating this, so we would be able to mobilize additional capital to invest in uh, climate action. So again, so key point is really highlighting this interlinkage and integration. Thank you. Thank you, Simon. Um, great point there about that interlinkage. And I want to, to turn to Aisha for her perspective on this. Well, I think it's it's really important to highlight in here the importance of raising the awareness of the financial sector to be more, you know, engaged in financing the this type of projects and seeing the real economic value of that. Because 
We believe that if they are not bring, uh, they are not brought to the table of the discussion, then without their financing uh, ability, we will not be able to move forward. That's why I would like to share with you uh, our experience in this regard, where we had formed a national sustainable finance group, and that group had. Um, the potential players from the financing, banking, insurance uh, sector, and we bring them all together in order to first raise their awareness about this importance and also to discuss matters like taxonomy, for example, and how that is affecting their, their working. And also we are working with them on the ESG, the environmental social governance that needs to be in there and how we can encourage the companies to report about their activities. And in that reporting, they have to show, for example, the um, whether it's a, a direct materiality or it's a non-materiality value of their activities, they have to, to show it and to have to report about it. So these are, I think, some of the mechanisms that can be used with the financial sector in order to raise their awareness and in order to get them on board when it comes to financing such uh, initiatives and raising, I would say, or identifying the return on investment, not only in dollar sign, but also in other, you know, aspects related to quality of life and to the uh, quality of um, uh, the air that the people are, uh, uh, you know, living like within that community, they have to or they have the right to have a better air to and you know, so it's it's really important that we address this within our work here and this is something that we did at the United Arab Emirates as well. Great. Thank you, Aisha. We're almost at time and I am apologize to uh, panelists who haven't had an opportunity to come back in, but I did want to sort of make sure we have um, a final thoughts from, from folks um, on what they've learned this morning and um, how they think the flagship will help them. Um, and um, we may have time for all everyone if everyone limits themselves to 30 seconds. So Beatrice, your, your quick thoughts, please. Well, I, I think that what we have heard this, uh, this morning is that there is a lot of, um, of, of uh, I mean, agreement that the flagship will bring us a lot, uh, all of us in, in being uh, either in the different elevator and the same elevator to the same place. <laughs> and I think that uh, I, I, I also agree that uh, the narrative that we have to build needs to be more uh, strong and more integrated. I think that we have failed in, in giving a, a very good narrative uh, to convince everyone. So the flagship could help us in doing that. Great. So better, better narrative. Um, Jed, your thoughts? Well, I think for me, I, the, the most important thing is to is to to keep the uh, the discourse going and to be able to pass it on. I, I as uh, having an urban planning background, I'm looking into the future and uh, I'm I'm telling myself, well, we're all here today and we're we're talking about this together. There are experts. There are there are people from different backgrounds, but then perhaps a decade or two down the line, there will be different people in the room and we might no longer be around. So it's quite important that the discourse continues between the generations of experts, if you will, as well as those who are recipients of, of, of their expertise. Thank you. Great. Thanks very much. Musumi, do you have some final thoughts? Yes, just uh, uh, resonating what Ajeg just talked about as well, which is uh, keeping the discussion going. Um, it may be early, but it's important to get started. It is also important to be aware that there is a lot of resources and there is a huge opportunity for integration and leveraging the work that's already going on um, to move forward in this journey. So thank you. Thanks very much. Um, Thiv, do you have some final thoughts? No? Okay. Uh, thanks very much. Um, uh, Aisha? Just one more thought and important note to make in here re related to the integration. We have to keep in mind that yes, reduction, emission reduction, mitigation and quantification can be shared aspects, but there are differences in the global and localized effects of greenhouse gases versus the air quality pollutants. So these differences necessitate the variation in the formulation of the measures and the different measures that should be in a place. Thank you. Thanks very much. A final thought from you, Rob? Just to echo what other people have said, to keep the energy and momentum really going and, and you know, just continue, um, continue the dialogues. 
Thanks very much. Elevate the issue. Yeah, lots of lots of elevator action. Um, <laughs> Sang Min, so, uh, some final thoughts? So regarding one of the key goal uh, for supporting regional and sub-regional cooperation under this uh, Clean Air flagship, I really wish that this can elaborate a different context of a different regional context and then but what are the similar uh challenges and then so what could be you know mutually you know uh supportive and especially the European experience they have more now almost 45 years history for the convention. Certainly we can't replicate their institutional model, but how they utilize the science for policy development. So that can be very useful references. So hope this uh, uh, report can really elaborate the details. Thank you. Thank you very much, Sangmin. And thank you um, to all the panelists for their fascinating insights into this issue. And I think um, um, just to finish by thanking Nathan for, um, for the elevator analogy, which um, has helped sustain the entire panel. Um, through this through this last hour, I mean, but it is it symbolizes a desire for a desire to to take this take work on clean air to to another level, um, and there are some really very concrete and and um, worthwhile elements to the flagship that we discussed today, in which. Uh, which no doubt the colleagues at CCAC will now make more concrete and will take through their governance structures and, and will emerge from the end of that into, in, in something that will, that will form a real solid action plan, um, that the CCAC will then engage us all in. So thank you to the colleagues at CCAC for pushing this forward and thank you once again to the panel and it's time for coffee. Yeah,
Kung bago na yung mga mga taga ito, na pa lang water dito. Ayun, sa mga Ah, I think baka, let me, let me check out. Okay. Okay. Hello, if you could please take your seats again so that we can start this exciting next session. I'm glad that uh, our first session has generated so much debate. Uh, it's fantastic uh, to see this. I wanted to make an announcement that whoever is interested in a site discussion on what could go into a resolution, uh, we will have a room available to do that this afternoon. I will make an announcement on the room, but I wanted to plant that seed to have it with everybody so that you can give some thought to it if you'd like to be part of that. So that's one. Um, while we're getting our panel back together and you all take your seats. And I thought it was really, really exciting to see that we have a few starting points of concrete collaboration and leadership uh, for the Clean Air flagship. Um, it's coming together very nicely. And uh, one other point I wanted to mention, because uh, Jed made a very vibrant uh, point about youth engagement. We have a whole youth group um, in the room as well, uh, and, uh, and a few others actually joining virtually. And I would encourage you, if you'd like, um, to reach out to them. And they're all seated over there. Why, why don't you just get up um, so that everybody sees you? So that's the new guard <laughs> already in the room. Um, so for all of you <laughs> to know, and you have a new youth, uh, youth strategy, and that will be uh, presented as well at the end of, uh, of our, our conference. But thank you so much for being with us. Uh, but now everybody has seen you. Uh, so please engage. And uh, the day has been set up uh, in in a way that we dig deeper and deeper. Now we'll hear some success stories, um, both from national and local level. And then again, um, the, the regionals So we have two panels uh, will be pretty tight in terms of timing, um, but uh, definitely very interesting. And then in the afternoon, we have regional discussions. So we come together as regional groupings. Uh, there is a room change that I want to announce, and I will announce it again uh, before we end. But uh, uh, the Africa group will be in uh, in this room because this one is the one that provides us with uh, interpretation. So Asia was planned to be here. Um, Asia will be um, so. There's a room switch basically. But I'll say that again. And with that, we have everybody back here. We have some silence in the room, which is fantastic. And uh, I can hand over uh, to uh, the facilitation of this first session uh, on tackling air pollution at the city and the national level. Um, and we have some opening remarks from um, our colleague, Renee Gift, uh, legal officer at the Unit Law Division. Renee? Here, I saw you up there first. <laughs> Good morning, everyone. Uh, thank you for having me. My name is Renee Gift. I'm a legal officer at the Law Division of UNEP. I think there's a presentation. Okay, great. So today I'll talk to you about UNEP's guide on ambient air quality legislation. Um, the purpose, and I'll talk more about the purpose of the guide, but how I think I will focus on how this guide can help countries create their own success stories. So to begin with, I just want to give some background about UNEP's mandate on working on legislation and, and environmental rule of law. The Montevideo Environmental Law Program is a 10-year intergovernmental program designed to promote environmental rule of law build related capacities and contribute to the achievement of the environmental dimensions of the SDGs. It establishes seven objectives, including supporting the development of adequate and effective environmental legislation, strengthening the effective implementation of environmental law, supporting enhanced capacity building and supporting countries in developing and implementing environmental rule of law, and the Montevideo program recently established a law and environmental assistance platform 
an online platform whereby countries can directly request technical legal assistance on environmental rule of law topics and issues directly from the Secretariat. And I would encourage you uh, to go online and to find out more information about how you as a country can request this kind of assistance. <clears throat> so my presentation will focus um, very uh, heavily on air quality legislation. Why do we focus on air quality legislation? To begin with, legislation in the context of, of my presentation and in this, the research that we've been doing refers to all laws and regulations made under legislative authority or established by any formal state-sponsored legislative process. So in two, 2021, UNEP's Actions and Air Quality Report highlighted law as one of the key responses to the air pollution crisis. It, the purpose, laws and, and regulations can establish mechanisms to ensure institutional responsibility, transparency, and accountability. It can create administrative frameworks to support and entrench the implement, implementation of air quality standards, including monitoring requirements and enforcement mechanisms. Legislation embeds processes for reviewing air quality standards and plans. And they're well adopted, legislative processes are well adapted to the collective cross-sectoral and evolving problem of air pollution. And legislation has is symbolically important as well. It projects an authoritative state-sponsored vision on air quality issues and facilitating and facilitates also social and economic change. So with this in mind, UNEP created the first global assessment of air pollution legislation in 2021. This report assessed national air quality legislation in 194 countries and the European Union against a, mo a, a model of robust air quality governance developed also as part of the research. The core principle of this research was that ambient air quality standards, when legally framed and institutionally embedded, create a bedrock of robust air quality governance system. The report addressed whether national measures exist for determining whether air quality standards were being met. So importantly, it did not look at whether air quality standards were met in practice, but what were the legal consequences and, and the legal frameworks for uh, regulating air quality? What were the legal consequences for failure to meet those standards as well? The assessment added to existing global studies and air quality standards with a clear focus on law and legislative structures. And this is a bit difficult to see, but when we say, when we talk about a robust system of air quality governance, what are we talking about? And it's one with a number of different characteristics. What makes a legislative system or governance system of air quality effective? Because I think often we think about the existence or, or non-existence of air quality standards, but there are many things that go along with, an, uh, with making air quality governance effective. And that requires governments to develop and review applicable air quality standards in light of public health objectives, to determine institutional responsibility for those standards and define consequences for failure to meet those standards and to monitor compliance, among others. There were many findings that came out of the report and I would just quickly go over them, but I think one key point was that overall, the global picture of national air quality laws is one of heterogeneity. There are different metrics, standards and, and obligations adopted and different governance actors implicated. There was a global trend that was seen uh, in where 64% of the countries embed ambient air quality standards and legislation. Um, and uh, many countries did not define air pollution. Um, there was no common framework for ambient air quality standards globally. And importantly, only 31% of countries had legal mechanisms for managing or addressing transboundary air pollution. So based on these findings, um, we developed the ambient, the guide on ambient air quality legislation. 
which translated the key findings of the global assessment on air pollution legislation into concrete questions and considerations for lawmakers. It targeted countries seeking, it, this guide targets countries seeking to develop or improve the national air, ambient air quality legislation and aims to provide guidance on how to develop robust national systems of air quality guidance. It, the, the main, one of the main tenets of this uh, guide is that regulatory alignment across wide ranging policy areas is critical to achieving ambient air quality in practice. How is this guide applicable to other countries? Specific national legal expertise will be needed to adapt the guide in, within region national specific national contexts. Um, environmental conditions will obviously be important in considering how to develop legislation that is relevant and effective for the countries, since air quality drivers and the nature of receptors need to be uh, considered. And cost and capacity constraints will differ from country to country, and of course there will be different political contexts. But the guide provides uh, a, a very good uh, basis for understanding what are the key principles that are needed in developing national legislation. And uh, finally, um, some of the quick, just very quickly, some of the priorities addressed in the guide include that ambient air quality standards should be set in a legal instrument so that they are embedded within a wider legal structure. Um, there should be regular review of legislation over time to take into consideration later scientific developments. And the WHO air quality guidelines provide a starting point for national evaluation of ambient air quality standards. The guide addresses different uh, points, including the, the scope, the legal construction of air, air quality monitoring systems, and procedural rights in relation to air quality. So I encourage you to look at, uh, I encourage you please to look at the guide. It's available online and there's so much more that you can take it, take away from it so that countries themselves can develop their success stories. Thank you. Thanks very much, Renee. And uh, Renee will be with us in the second panel. Um, so if there are any questions that uh, can actually feed into that. And now I hand over to uh, Philippe, uh, Philippe Brunet. He is a program manager for climate change and environment at the Swiss Agency for Development and Cooperation and uh, uh, focal point for the CCAC as well. <laughs> Please. Thank you, Martina, and good morning to everyone. It's really a great pleasure to moderate this panel on tackling air pollution at the city and at the national level. As we heard in the in the previous session, the CCC Clean Air flagship is going to be an excellent opportunity to galvanize efforts for speeding action to uh, tackle air pollution, which remains urgent as ever to protect uh, health, improve well-being, protect the environment, and which can also help us accelerate our mitigation efforts. And to deliver on cleaner air for all, we know that action is critical both at the national level and at the city level. And so this is what we're going to delve into uh, in a more, bit more detail in this session. And we've just had a great overview from UNEP on how countries are approaching air quality legislation and UNEP's guide on ambient air quality legislation, which is a good segue into this. And we have an excellent lineup this morning for taking us on a bit of a round the world journey, diving into the experiences of, of different countries and municipal authorities, as well as international organizations and partnerships that are all championing action to improve air quality. So let's get right into it, and I'll introduce people as they speak. And let's first turn to our host, Thailand, with Ms. Siwaporn Rungsiyanun, who is the Director of Transboundary Air Pollution Subdivision of the Air Quality and Noise Management Division of the Pollution Control Department of Thailand. Over to you for the question on... A two-part question, actually, for you. On first, Bangkok's success in scaling electric ferries, buses, and tuk-tuks, what, what have been the critical components of that? And also on how do you think that cities can best be encouraged to tackle air pollution? Over to you. Thank you, Philip. And uh, good morning to everyone. Uh, I'm very pleased to join the panel discussion today. Uh, to answer to your question, the first part is the, the uh, scaling up 
electricity vehicle in Bangkok. I I see that Bangkok is not different from others, right? We also uh, face the same barriers that including on technological, financial, and institutional. But in overall, I think Bangkok, uh, the the critical component of Bangkok success are four things. First thing is price structure of the vehicles. Second is infrastructure cost, like charging station. And third is the operational limit of the e-vehicle. And fourth, the most important thing is the clear decision to move from combustion engine to to electric. And for the second question, uh, what do I think city can be best encouraged? to tackle air quality from my experience with working with uh, national and uh, local authority is technical support. Uh, take city of Bangkok, for example, like this year we have, uh, in Bangkok we face a very serious air pollution, but I see the uh, readiness of the city of Bangkok in terms of, you know, human resources, budget, equipment, and et cetera, et cetera. But what we need is technical support. The city of Bangkok need to know the clear picture of air pollution, right? And to know what's it the sort, how to manage. Uh, so the national government need to support in terms of data information, how to and the plan and measure development. And we need to be, uh, uh, another thing is we need to be a hub, right? To gather together our stakeholder with the city. Right, uh, from NGO, from academic, from media to work with the city. And, uh, I have a small point. Uh, I, I, in Thailand, like we have a big hot air pollution problem in Bangkok and northern part of Thailand. And I have to say that, uh, the national government, uh, have a very good relationship with the local government at all level, you know province um, and municipality and uh, in in the d- during the haze season that is very serious situation in northern part of Thailand the national government you know develop policy and declare to the local and the governor used single command management and command to at all level to district sub district until the uh, head of the village headman so uh, what what in conclusion was important is technical support and networking hub. Thank you, Phil. Thank you so much, CEO Born, for those insights from, from Bangkok and from Thailand. I think definitely retaining uh, your call for technical support to cities that national governments can assist with and bringing together the stakeholders and also fostering this good relationship between the national and local governments to address uh, critical air pollution issues. And for participants here, there'll be a chance also to see um, some of the, some of Bangkok's efforts on um, e-mobility with e-buses and e-ferries um, this Friday during the the field visits. And on the Swiss side, we're also very glad to be working with uh, with Thailand and Bangkok on uh, electric buses as well uh, through Article Six of the Paris Agreement. So contributing there to um, hopefully tackling uh, reducing uh, air pollution in Bangkok. So now we're going to turn to Jakarta staying in Southeast Asia, but taking uh, a look at um, transportation sector also as one of Jakarta's main sources of pollution with Ms. Silvana Tarigan, who's head of Environment and Green Open Space Division of the Development and Environment Bureau of DKI Jakarta in Indonesia. And so Ms. Tarigan, Jakarta is currently seeking solutions to reducing transport emissions. What does Jakarta and Indonesia more broadly need from CCAC and bilateral aid in terms of support to help scale solutions for transportation and as well as for other SLCP emitting sectors? Okay, thank you, Mr. Granit. Uh, good morning, ladies and gentlemen. First of all, I want to express my gratitude and my thankful for all of the steering committee and organizing committee in UNCC Bangkok. Due to by this event, all of the participants and delegates can share information each other and also mutual supporting how to get, how to increase the green, cleaner air in our city as well as in our country and also in our earth. Before I explain about the uh, 
air pollution in Jakarta, please allow me to introduce the overview of Jakarta as follow. Jakarta is the capital city of Indonesia and consists of five municipalities. There are center of Jakarta, south and north of Jakarta, east and west of Jakarta, and one remote regency is in the island of the Gulf of Jakarta. The population of Jakarta is different between day and night. In the afternoon, the population of Jakarta is 20 million people, but in the evening, it's reduced to be approximately just 10 million people. How did it happen? Because in every morning, 10 million people come into Jakarta. They came from the surrounding area of Jakarta, such as Bogor, Tangerang, Bekasi, and Depok. And all of the commuter and the suburbanites come to the city to do their own activity in the city. And at night, they'll be back to their home base. The density of Jakarta is uh, 17,000 uh, people in each kilometer. Jakarta is also the greatest city of Indonesia. One of the indicators is about the gross domestic product of Jakarta. In spite of the uh, spatial or the coverage area of Jakarta is very tiny. If we percentage with compare with the national area, is just uh, 0.03%. But Jakarta can contribute 17% from national gross domestic product. And if Jakarta will affiliation with another city surrounding Jakarta, uh, such as Bogor, Tangerang, Bekasi, as I mentioned before, the Jakarta can contribute 25% for national gross domestic product. Speaking about the air pollution in Jakarta, I want to inform that the transportation uh, sector is the big one uh, support and contribute to the air pollution of Jakarta. Based on our uh, survey and our data, the transportation sector contribute more than 40% of the PM 2.5 in Jakarta. And the transportation sector is very related with the traffic congestion in Jakarta. We must realize nowadays the traffic congestion is occurred in Jakarta. Why the traffic congestion occurred in Jakarta? At least it's because of two reasons. One reason is in every day, 100 million trip in Jakarta. It is very huge for us. And the second reason is about the increasing of the vehicle in Jakarta is not balanced with the increasing of the road ratio in Jakarta. The figure, the increasing of uh, vehicle in Jakarta is more than 7.6%, but the increasing of road ratio in Jakarta is less than 1%. And you can imagine if we do nothing in this decade, no one vehicle can move in Jakarta. Local government uh, anticipated that situation and we have the strategy how to cope the uh, condition. One of our strategy is uh, shifting mode transportation from a private vehicle to public transport. Speaking about trans uh, public transport, if you want to generate all the people to use the public transport, we must provide the public transport with the level of service is higher. And nowadays, fortunately, local government and uh, central government also can uh, do everything uh, to, to do it. Nowadays in Jakarta, the, we have already uh, provided the uh, modern transport, uh, public transport such as MRT, LRT, BRT. Uh, in the other side, if you want to uh, scale, if you want to tracing the scale of uh, pollution air in Jakarta, we must have the 
measuring instrument. But I want to ask you that nowadays and until now, Jakarta only have five the air quality monitoring station and three uh, air quality monitoring station and mobile. And, you know, it is not sufficient to cover all of the air of Jakarta. Uh, fortunately, we have some co collaboration, such as the WERI, Air Catalyst, G40, and all of our partners suppose me, suppose us to install the uh, air quality station. Speaking about the uh, relationship between uh, local government and central government, until now, central government and local government also work together. For example, for, it's about the MRT project. MRT project is the project of a local government and central government integrated uh, from financing and from other measures uh, start from the planning from on the actuating, controlling the project. One, uh, the financing of uh, MRT project, 51% support by the local government and 49% promote by the central government. And I want to uh, underline that the relationship between central and local government until now running well. Thank you. Thank you very much, Mr. Taligan, for sharing uh, Jakarta's experience here. And it's really impressive the the scale of the challenges you're you're dealing with the, with this impressive number of commuters coming in and out of of the city every day with 100 million trips, like you mentioned. We can imagine the sheer scale of transportation needed and the the emissions associated there. Very interesting also to hear how you mentioned the need to enhance the, the service level um, for, for passengers there too, to, to drive this shift towards more public transport. And um, interesting to also hear the needs of, uh, of scaling the, the coverage of air, air quality uh, monitoring stations there. So now shifting continents and turning to Latin America, it's a great pleasure to also have on this panel Brazil, which is uh, the most recent CCAC state partner, the 80th uh, state partner to join the coalition. And uh, so we're very pleased to have Ms. Kaisa Perez Marcondes, who's the Deputy Director of the Environmental Quality Department of the Ministry of Environment and Climate Change of Brazil, um, to take us through what are Brazil's priorities with respect to air quality? So uh, quite a big question for uh, a limited time. I'm sure we could have uh, longer sessions in, in the future on this, but um, it would be great to get uh, some some initial insights from, from you. Over to you. Thank you, Philip. Uh, thank you, CCAC, for the opportunity. First of all, I'd like to comment briefly about our current scenario in Brazil, just to, be, uh, just to give you the big picture. And then I will introduce our future plans and main priorities. Uh, Brazil is a federation composed by 27 states and almost 6,000 municipalities. So you can imagine the size of our challenge in implementing any kind of uh, public policy. But we actually try our best. With uh, that many federal units and this huge territory, unfortunately, there is an asymmetry on the level of development of the states in terms of air quality. So by one side, we have the state of Sao Paulo, for example, that is considered a reference, a model of gover governance, uh, having a very well structured uh, strategy on air quality, having many stations spread across its territory. But by the other, the other side, we have some states, especially on the north region of Brazil, where there is any structure in place when it comes to air quality. So just to uh, clarify even more, uh, of these 27 states of Brazil, only 12 monitors air quality there. And even among these 12 states, the monitoring is not ideal because, uh, again, we have this asymmetry on the level of development of these states. And then in some of them, we have many states automatic states, but in other, uh, uh, we uh, the stations only uh, uh, monitors a few number of pollutants or they are manual. So as you can imagine, our 
Priority number one in Brazil is to improve our governance in terms of air quality uh, management and uh, expand our air quality monitoring network, especially focusing on the states where there is no structure in place. This action involves the strengthening of the state capacities, particularly related to the administrative, human and financial resources. So uh, it's important to bear in mind that our job as a national authority is not finished when we deliver a station or some stations to the local agencies. Uh, we need to provide capacity building sections, training, uh, knowledge transfer, resources to operate the, the stations. So we need to, to follow this process really closely. And uh, this is the point where we are right now in Brazil, defining our strategy to implement this uh, big network. And we are counting with the support of the Environmental Defense Fund. Thank you for that. And um, this is our part number one, to expand our uh, air quality monitoring network. And when it comes to uh, another priority in Brazil is to which is related to the Amazon region states, especially the urban cities uh, directly affected by wildfires. So we intend to monitor their quality there and to promote um, raising awareness campaigns among the local citizens. And uh, last but not least, our third priority is related to our methods and strategies to inspect uh, vehicles emissions, uh, especially the heavy vehicles, because uh, this is a big issue in Brazil, the vehicle emissions, and we need to strengthen our governance on that. This is the point I'd like to mention today, and thank you all for listening. Thank you so much, Kaiser. That was very interesting to hear our Brazil's priorities and also how you're addressing this in, in the federal system as well with the, with the asymmetries that you spoke of uh, and the different priorities, of course, in, in different states like in the Amazon as well. Now we're going to turn to the, well, to the World Health Organization, which has been a, a leading voice on advocating for, for clean air and also has uh, published the updated global air quality guidelines in 2021, which are a guiding star for for um, driving air quality efforts as well, and show that we have um, a long road ahead of us as well. Um, so we we have Miss Heather Adelhorohani with us um, today. She's the acting head of the Air Quality, Energy, and Health of um, the World Health Organization, and we'd like to hear a little bit more about um, WHO's work on this, and also on the Urban Health Initiative. Uh, which has uh, been working in Accra, Ghana, and uh, piloted a suite of tools for cities to, uh, to that that cities can use to tackle health, climate, and air pollution with health professionals and city stakeholders. So, how do you see Accra emerging as a hub for the region? Great, thank you, Philippe, and thank you, um, the CCA Secretariat, for having me here today. Um, I actually have a pleasure of reporting back for some work that was done for, for a number of years in actually the city of Accra. I'll give you a quick snapshot of what the Urban Health Initiative was for those who are not familiar with it. Essentially, Urban Health Initiative was really designed to focus looking at municipality governance to really try and to change air pollution strategies and to impact health. And how is it the health sector in leveraging that health argument can really drive policies, particularly when you can quantify those health impacts and use them to drive legislation or policy change. So accordingly, for several years, we had the basically the whole unit, we have a WHO on air quality working with various partners around household energy use, waste um, sector, as well as transport to see what are those particular policies that in these particular regions in, um, in, in Accra, what are the current policies, and what if we were to change those policies or put new policies in and model those scenarios to help understand what are the impacts on health and other, and other aspects related um, from various policies in those different sectors and what would that look like to help actually inform decision makers to be able to choose their policies based on those health as a driver. 
So we brought the full team out um, and, and various local expertise on the ground, and we basically held a number of trainings to build capacity locally to use the various tools and methods um, to understand what the current situation is, map out the stakeholders, and understand what are the policies and understand what are the options available to them. So we held various capacity building sessions with household energy, with the transport sector and the waste sector um, to see how that worked. And accordingly, we found out uh, some great some great things. Oh. Another aspect was not only knowing the statistics and understanding the policies, that's also important for the people around to understand what the problem is. So there was also an important component of the Urban Health Initiative, which was also training local journalists as well to speak to the issue, to make the general public aware of this uh, this information. Because we really want our policymakers who are making this action to continue their, their role. So we needed to drive that action from a population level as well. So we basically created a, a very large network of various experts working on this at a very high scientific level. It was very evidence-based uh, uh, driven, and we held various workshops or training capacity working sh workshops with local stakeholders to understand the various tools that we have, for example, the heat tool to look at transport and what are the benefits of walking and cycling and how can you actually lower emission levels from various stations and transport, household energy as well. We looked at various interventions, we modeled those various um, scenarios and what would be the health impact impacts and on both the indoor air pollution and ambient air pollution levels, as well as we looked at specifically what is the waste sector, as it's a very important sector in a number of cities across the African region and other places in the world to see what would be the benefits from various different waste um, uh, policies, which is essentially came to be stop burning waste, but use other alternatives. So this actually provided a lot of capacity building for local stakeholders, which we hope that we can actually replicate in other cities across the region. As this, you know, Ghana has now basically has an army of professionals trained to tackle air quality and health and, and often led by the health sector. Now, adding the whole health sector component, there's another aspect, too, that was really amazing that happened. It actually happened in Ghana as a total, but we took a lot of the professionals that we met through the Urban Health Initiative, and we had a training this past July. We piloted our health sector training so that we actually trained clinicians and physicians about the health impacts of air pollution um, so that they could actually incorporate this into their own practice and especially prescribe clean air. So this is a train your train of the module approach so that now we have a number of trained physicians as well in Ghana who are also able to advocate for clean air and speak to, and basically drive not only the local population to understand, but as well as for policymakers. So I would say in terms of ACRA, they are ready and prepped, and we have a number of experts now on the ground ready to really share their expertise with other cities around in the region to really replicate this and improve air quality. So I really... Um, I would say that that's would I could definitely see them as as a as a hub and someone to really start work. All these results are available online on, on our Urban Health Initiative website, where you can see we actually have a summary report where we walk through the various workshops and trainings that we had and the and the experiences and expertise that was highlighted and used. And and we now have, yeah, as I said, one of the largest body of scientific evidence on one specific city in Africa around air quality measures and what are the policies and what are the related health impacts as resulting from the urban health initiative. So this is something that could definitely be replicated and can really start tr spreading out the word and use those armies from across of uh, experts um, around um, in other cities in the, in the region. Thank you. Thanks so much, Heather, for sharing this experience of the Urban Health Initiative in uh, with Accra. It's great to hear, very encouraging. And certainly the, the modeling of the scenarios with the different benefits, on, uh, including for health of different policies and actions that can be taken to inform decision makers, that's something that's certainly critical and that the CCAC can also help um, partner countries with. Very interesting to hear also the work that you did with uh, with journalists to raise uh, awareness. That's something that comes up regularly also in these conversations. How can we increase the, that public awareness and to bring in the, the health sector to have them on board as well? That's uh, seems like a very encouraging way forward. So now we're going to stay in Africa for a bit longer and we're going to look at a difficult sector that's really key to, to tackle to protect people's health, in particular that of, of women and girls which is the household air pollution sector, but which uh, with that pollution not staying in the home, but also contributing to to um, outdoor air pollution, of course. And it's also been an area of, of longstanding engagement of, of the CCC. But we're, we're going to turn to Uganda to hear the, the experience there with Mr. Fred Onyai, who's a national SLCP planning and implementation expert for Uganda. And so the, the question for you is that the CCC is supporting development of a national clean cook stove strategy for, for Uganda. 
And it would be great to hear from you the lessons that you see from this experience that would be helpful for other countries that are interested in tackling household air pollution. Thank you, Philip. Um, I will I will look at these questions in the context of uh, what I'll call the success fa factors or con the preconditions for us to have um, a success stories when it comes to the issue to do with them, uh, household and the uh, outdoor air pollution uh, generally in Uganda and Africa. Um, I look at um, basically five key factors. The first one is the, the mindset change. I think it is very important that when we talk about um, uh, using the clean cook stoves, we need to, to, to look at the users. Believe me or not, people come from Africa, you know that uh, some mothers, some uh, sisters will say that I, I, I rather use the, the three stone uh, open fire uh, system for cooking than going for the uh, improved cook stoves because the previous one cooks better. So that's already a mindset, a mindset problem. The, that needs to be ch changed through uh, awareness programs. Number two is the issue of engagement of leaders and the other stakeholders. These are the people who are who are working with the leaders. And if we don't engage leaders at that level, then they cannot help us mobilize the, the users of these cook stoves. And then we cannot cause any improvement as intended. Then uh, number three is the issue of technology. And technology choice here, we have got four aspects. One is affordability. Uh, two is the uptake, the capacity of these users to ensure that uh, they are able to, to use the technology. And more so, do you have alternatives? Because the tendency of cost, cost is involved when we, when we talk about improved technologies. But what alternatives do we have for these people? Or we just give them one alternative, and once the one cannot afford, say, I cannot do it. And therefore, you have not done anything uh, to improve on the conditions. And then number four for technology is the sustainability. Are we able to sustain what we are giving out? Whether it's a cook stove in an institution, or is a cook stove at household level? Because remember, this is a new technology. And then number three, uh, success factor is the issue of financing and investments. I think we need to think big. We need to be ambitious. We are doing too many small investments that have got little impact sometimes. In Uganda, we have got um, a population of uh, 41 million people at uh, an average size, as of size of uh, 4.6 people. So if you look at uh, around close to 10 million households, but take into account that uh, out of this, 60% uh, uh, is using the traditional uh, cook stoves, the three stone uh, open fire system. And we are still at talking for 71% of this population is using uh, uh, direct firewood, only leaving uh, around um, uh, 27% that are using um, improved cook stoves. So look at this kind of various uh, uh, situations that will need to be addressed. And therefore, we need the big investments in this area, both for institutions and for households. The last part, the number five key factor is what you call the uh, the approach we use, I think, as already said by, by my colleagues here, the panelists, we tend to go uh, in a one-way approach that we are we are talking about climate change. We're talking about environmental protection. But I think we need to have approach what we call the, the core benefits approach. Let's look at holistic approach, that the benefits cut across the sectors, not only uh, climate action, not only environmental protection or air quality, but also about livelihood improvement and the societal well-being in terms of health, in terms of um, food security and otherwise. Now, this brings the issue of how do we support the local authorities, the municipalities and the cities. In the, in the, in the scenario of Uganda, I will, I will look at the three areas of support. The first one is, of course, technical support, the area of enforcement, Okay. These cities need to be a, a help, area of enforcement, area of regulations and standards. And then number two is the issue of air quality capacity. Air quality capacity in terms of the technical capability, in terms of equipment and technology. We are aware that uh, most of our cities have got unpaved roads, and that, that's going to be a lot to the, to, the, to, the, to, to the dust atmosphere, to the PMs. And therefore, we need that either element of real-time air quality monitoring. And then last but not least is the, the issue of investments. 
We need to support the municipalities, the cities, investments in waste management, investments in um, in even infrastructure like roads. But of course, the CCC will not do that. But CCC can help us uh, mobilize the resources from other uh, other part of the sources, especially at the private sector at multilateral and bilateral level. Thank you very much. Thanks so much for sharing that. There's there's a lot in in there in the success factors, and maybe just highlighting three three elements that I thought were were really key here in terms of mindset change. There's been many pilot cookstove projects that have that have also failed on on that, failing to failing to account for that, and just looking at a, at a good technological solution, but that's not uh, enough for adoption by by any means. I think your, your encouragement also that we need to think big, look at bigger programs, not just uh, single pilot projects. That, that makes a lot of sense and how to, how to help leverage bigger investments and to have that holistic approach with the multiple co-benefits is, is really, really key. And I think uh, something that the, the CCC is very, um, has been working on very, very strongly. So we're coming to, we're slightly over our time actually, but we still have a speaker, a final speaker who is going to, uh, wrap us up from her vantage point with an excellent overview, I think, uh, because we have quite a quite a big question for you. So for Miss Milag San Jose Balesteros, she's the regional director for East, Southeast Asia and Oceania of C40. So quite a big region. And I think this is going to be a great way to wrap up because we'd like to hear from you based on your experience working with cities. What do you see as elements of success? What What works? What has worked? What resonates? And how do you think we can scale best practices? Thank you very much, Philip. And um, again, good morning, everyone. Appreciate very much the opportunity to contribute. Those are like series of questions which I feel each would require an hour. Um, but 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 just hearing and sitting in this panel, um, you know, hearing um, Thailand reference, Bangkok, uh, of course, Jakarta, Ibu Silvana is, is a friend, and uh, we work with closely hearing about Accra, as well as Sao Paulo, and what's happening in uh, in Uganda. While we see the diversity. Uh, cross cities and the contextualized approach, I think we cannot discount that there are cross-cutting uh, elements when we talk about good practices or looking at success stories in terms of being able to um, to scale. Um, coming from C40, which is a, um, a climate leadership group uh, primarily working with cities, um, I, I would like to highlight that C40's vision is that all people, no matter where they live, can breathe clean air and enjoy healthier, more active lives. And that means C40 cities are taking the lead by implementing data-driven approaches to meet WHO air quality guidelines. Heather, that's a positive note. While addressing the climate crisis um, through deep decarbonization and increasing climate resilience. At this point, I wanted to emphasize, we always hear about climate crisis, climate emergency. But when we look at the statistics that's being shared, if 99% of your population is breathing really dirty air and affecting health, affecting productivity, affecting social and economic aspects of the society, isn't that as well? a crisis in itself. And that's where C40 comes in with that full appreciation that while we are working on the climate crisis or addressing the climate emergency, it's the understanding of that urgency to likewise work on air quality, which, you know, we always say, as, as we know on the ground, is not necessarily mutually exclusive. There are actual interventions that um, help each other or, you know, um, resources could be maximized to address both. So just lifting from what um, um, my fellow panelists mentioned here in terms of um, elements of success, I think I can narrow it down in terms of our experience working with cities, in some cases, international organizations and national governments as well. One is really establishing robust data, whether it's demographics, as what, you know, Jakarta mentioned, you knowing where your population hots pass, but more importantly, of course, robust air quality data to inform the public and policymaking. That involves what was mentioned in terms of public communication engagement, whether it's journalists, whether it's women, young girls affected, to ensure a common understanding of air pollution risk and its solutions. The other is inclusive policy making and shared governance. So it's really working with a broader stakeholders. And what I mean by shared governance is not just, you know, having input in terms of the policy, but actually owning it. 
having that ownership in terms of programs and initiatives. We always say in C40, a city is not just a city government. A city is really a complex. And I think, you know, even when you go to the country, a country is not defined, but it's national government, but it's really widening that ownership. And that's what I would refer to in terms of shared governance, having people stake uh, and really um, taking action individually and as institutions. Um, I think Fred referenced already the real clarity in terms of investment and financing of zero emission solution. Uh, where, for example, it overlaps, you know, emissions that relate to air quality, but also emissions that relate to greenhouse gas emissions. And so moving forward, I think um, uh, that's where um, cities and, um, of course, governments and institutions would require, you know, support. It's really measuring air quality to understand the problem at the local level, you know, where where sort of like the hotspots are. Um, and we've done this um, with Lagos, Rio de Janeiro, Quezon City um, in the region as well, um, together with Jakarta in terms of really looking at that and grounding those interventions. Setting local targets would be key. You know, you have the data, but what's your ambition? Yes, we're talking about success stories now, but it also comes with a reality that we are moving in the right direction, but we have to do more. So while we are moving, what is the question is that how do we make it more transformative? And that's where targets really play a key role because that's where you also relate to the public where you are in terms of addressing. And that's where you need um, the, a science-based appreciation of uh, discussions on air quality. Uh, maybe next is that uh, part of that is developing an air quality management plan and integrating it with other urban planning processes. You know, sometimes when you talk about air quality, oh, it's, you know, it's the pollution division or it's the Department of Environment. But as we know, as I think all of the participants know, it's not as simple as that. Cities are complex. Um, national governments as well as countries are complex. And Everyone has to be involved. It's talking about industries. It's talking about your trade and investment. It's talking about your investment officer within within cities as well. It's talking about those engaging with the community, those working with women, with youth. So I think it's more of like, how do you really integrate that in the same way that we are discussing that within the climate space, for example? And maybe as a last point, it's really bringing together Air quality management and climate action. We've heard this from, I think, the, the starting plenary yesterday in the different, um, in the different, um, sessions. They're not mutually exclusive. And when we talk about the real benefits in terms of health, in terms of economic, in terms of social, just looking at green space, I, I've always wondered when you talk about green space, it relates to air quality. It relates to resiliency or climate resiliency within the cities. It could be a carbon sink when you talk about emissions reduction. But one of the key things that really also drives that is what does it mean in terms of the community or the resident? What does it mean from a working mother, you know, having access to an open space, you build the community within the neighborhood, you know, you have your kids um, uh, playing. It could also be the men within the family being able to do that. What does public transport mean in terms of addressing air quality, addressing emissions, but making sure, for example, that your, um, your communities living in Suetos or urban poor communities have access, have that mobility to be able to move around, work, play, and also um, engage in like education and enriching themselves. So I think at the bottom of it is like looking at that in a more, um, in a more holistic, um, in a more holistic way. And that's where I guess I'll just um, like to, um, to, to end in terms of um, air quality improvements in leading C40 cities that we've worked with have been achieved while moving forward with their transformative climate action priorities through um, political will. And then, of course, it's linked to air quality. And that includes leveraging their voices in gathering support from and advocating for increased ambition, resources, and real partnership from national governments. Uh, so I'm, I'm very keen to understand a bit more on the CCAC flagship and what's the role of like subnational local governments there. Public support and um, data-driven multilateral 
policy efforts. And so um, maybe I'll end there, but I know there's a lot of room for exchange as we go deeper in terms of the the the, the real um, you know various cases that were shared here. But I hope that has provided um, our audience as well as, of course, it's always a reflex reflection as well, self re reflection for each of us as I listen in. So thank you very much for this opportunity. And I hope I did justice in terms of summarizing those things. Thank you very much, Philip. Thanks so much, Milag, for finishing us strong on this. And indeed, I think you did a very good justice to, 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 the, to the summary of this session, let's say, or trying to tie in different elements. And I won't re-summarize that, but uh, I think what, one of the elements, too, of the setting local targets you mentioned to drive efforts, keep up the ambition, that that's critical. Also, that this is not the end of the discussion. Far from it. It's going to be the beginning of, a, of many more discussions also with the, with the CCAC Clean Air flagship. And I think uh, just to pick up on uh, on one of the things you said, and I think it's an excellent way to end too, that tackling air pollution is absolutely urgent. It is also an emergency and it can, it is something that we can and should be addressing together with the climate crisis. So plenty more to discuss. Just a big thank you to all the panelists. And so I'd invite you all to give a big round of applause to all the panelists. And so uh, we have a quick change around of our panels. It was ex so I could, if I could kindly ask everybody who is on the next panel to come up here. Uh, we make it a flying change. It was extremely, exactly. <laughs> Thank you. Um, it was extremely ambitious to have these two panels, uh, super interesting panels in this uh, one session. Um, it was our best shot, but a little over time. Uh, we will hopefully um, make up a little bit, otherwise we'll bite in a little bit into uh, the the time um, of or the lunchtime. And we have already Kevin here, Kevin Hicks, Senior Research Fellow of the Stockholm Environment Institute uh, and um, long-term engaged in activities of the CCAC and very much so uh, behind the uh, Africa assessment that we just launched. And I just wanted to hold that thought. I'm sure we will say something about that as well. Um, as we look into uh, the regional cooperation, because that was one way of starting cooperation as well with scientists, for example. But I stop here and I hand over to, to Kevin and our new fantastic panel that has taken seed. Thank you. Thank you very much, Martina. And hello, everyone. I'll try and keep this as exciting as possible because we've got half an hour before lunch. So I'm Kevin Hicks from the Stockholm Environment Institute, and I'm I've got regional cooperation in my blood and, and in my heart. And the success stories are out there in Europe. We're here about we've reduced sulf, um, sulfur dioxide, SOX and NOx uh, considerably in Europe and North America. We've um, solved the problem of lead in fuel around the world. And um, we've uh, moved towards um, low sulfur fuel in many regions like in Asia, Latin America and um, Asia, Latin America and in Africa, especially. So. Regional cooperation has helped leverage that progress around the world. So our session now today is what can we learn from our uh, esteemed panel about what are the magic ingredients for regional cooperation? And we know at its best that regional cooperation can help share awareness and understanding of an issue to bring consensus on an issue. We know that it can also um, share technical know-how uh, across uh, the scientific communities and the practitioners of how to move forward. And... Um, also, really importantly, um, share knowledge on mitigation and how to monitor and evaluate progress on the issue. So without any further ado, I shall move to um, my first speaker, um, which I'm very excited to introduce to you. It's Bert Fabian. And he, there you are at the end. Yeah. So Bert started life in transport, but now he's the head of the secretariat of ENET. So ENET is the Acid Deposition Monitoring Network in East Asia, and their strapline is Acid Deposition and Air Quality Monitoring from Data to Policy. And so, um, Bert, I'd like to ask you, you know, um, uh, the key questions here is how can air quality improvement collaboration work in your region? How are you moving forward with that? And how can you improve the situation in your region? The floor is yours. Thank you very much, Kevin. I think it's always wonderful to see old friends in uh, meetings like this. As you uh, mentioned, I've been in this uh, work for the last uh, 20 years. In it, in it is a nice story. It is not popular because also it is not often told. 
It started 22 years ago. Uh, this was also about the same time as I was building my career on air pollution transport. And it's probably one of the probably one of the first uh, uh, intergovernmental bodies uh, dealing with air pollution in East Asia. So Northeast Asia and Southeast Asia. There are uh, five countries in Northeast Asia, Russia, China, Japan, South Korea, Mongolia, and then you have eight developing countries in Southeast Asia. So this is uh, eight developing countries except uh, Brunei, Singapore, and also Timor-Leste. At that time, the story is uh, early, uh, late 1990s, the issue was sulfur dioxide emissions. I'm sure many of you will remember this. Our fuels have, have very high levels of uh, sulfur. Uh, stationary sources, uh, power plants also uses high levels of sulfur in coal, but it also in fuel. Uh, at that time, uh, sulfur dioxide, uh, nitrous oxides, this was, uh, or oxides of nitrogen, this was the issue in the region. And uh, there was a clamor, uh, a hope that uh, the countries can work together and also to address this uh, situation. So they got together, uh, these uh, 13 countries in the region. Eventually, they all signed what is called an instrument. Uh, to strengthen this kind of partnership. So it's some something of a legal document that these countries have signed together. And uh, actually in 2021, the countries decided uh, to uh, make it more explicit that this intergovernmental body works on air pollution because it is called Acid Deposition Monitoring Network in East Asia. Of course, we all know that acidifying substances are also air pollutants. Sulfur dioxide is a criteria air pollutant. But having said this, the countries decided to make this explicit, and it's good. And the countries also decided to make uh, what is called an ENET project fund. Because I said the story of ENET is not often told. It's because it's uh, it's working more with the governments, uh, the ministries of environment uh, in a structured manner, meaning they have this yearly intergovernmental meetings. There is a scientific advisory committee meet, meeting uh, of which the governments identify scientists in their countries. There are a lot of researchers uh, a lot of studies that had been done, uh, many government officials trained. So it's really a long march to the institution, if I can say that, uh, trying to support a capacity of government officials, but in a very narrow, restricted, and government-sanctioned, uh, if I can say that, sanctioned manner. So this helped a lot in terms of improving capacity of the government officials and in turn uh, support efforts to pass policies on having Euro 4 vehicle emission standards, on limiting uh, or putting in scrubbers into stationary sources. It has supported, through the uh, government activities, this kind of efforts. Uh, but now ENET is in a transition. It wants to work more with other uh, organizations. It is not limiting itself to the countries themselves. So this time, and we will have an awareness event later this afternoon, we are working on VOCs, volatile organic compounds, and we are working with other organizations outside of ENET. Very few organizations are working on VOCs. Plastic burning, this also includes uh, or affects uh, VOC emissions, which of course also influences our air, air quality. And also low-cost sensors, like probably when you went to Bangkok, or maybe not this time, you were checking your phones for uh, IQ air, like what's the level of air pollution. But nobody is really talking about how this is integrated into the national government air quality monitoring network. So ENET is starting to look at this. And ENET is starting to look for partners with other organizations uh, to work with the government, this intergovernmental process, and implement projects, and in turn, the good thing, a bad thing is intergovernmental bodies we know are slow. The good thing is uh, the countries have signed up for it. So if there is a process, if there is a study, if there is a recommendation, we can always go back to the country and say, like, look, you have signed up for this. This is what you have said. It is recorded in the meeting. So maybe I stop here. It's I'm not sure if uh, the story is quite long now, but I, I hope <laughs> I, I gave a good story. Thank you. Thank you very much, Burton.
And I think you under underlined for us really, because ENET's got a long history, so it's the importance of a legal framework and um, the importance of the regular meetings so that the countries can get familiar with the issues. And it's really encouraging to hear that ENET has gone through a transition uh, towards being very clear about the, the issue that it's tackling and also bringing on new new issues as well. And those of you in the audience that know ENET know that there's a long history of, you know, being able to diversify in that way. So that's really encouraging that that, that's, that integration has been able to take place. So without further ado, um, I'd like to move to our second example, which is from South Asia. And I was lucky enough to be involved in the, in the birth of the Malay Declaration. And I'd like to welcome um, Ram, Ram La Verma um, to give us his insights. He's the uh, Secretariat of the Malay Declaration based um, in, in South Asia. So, um, so Verma, would you like to tell us about, about your network and, um, and it, it, where it is at the moment and how it can um, move forward in the future? Um, good morning, everyone. And um, thank you. Um, Hi, uh, thank you, Kevin, for um, inviting me, and thank you, CCSC, for giving me opportunity to speak about the Malay, and it's it's a uh, progress till now. So um, let me start with a brief history of the Malay Declaration, how and why it was established. So in 1998, um, the UNEP and the um, HCI um, recognized or drew an attention. Um, to the possibility of transboundary impact of air pollution in South Asia. And um, to communicate this uh, possibility, uh, UNEP and SCI, they organized a roundtable policy, high policy discussion um, in AIT um, in, 19, in March 1998, where the um, high-level um, policymakers from South Asia participated in the policy discussion and they decided to take a concrete concrete action uh, to address this transboundary um, effect of air pollution in South Asia. And they come up with a, a draft declaration, um, which was the declaration was adopted in the um, um, SACEF Governing Council uh, meeting, which organized the same year. And in the uh, Malay, which is the capital of the um, Maldives. And they uh, named the declaration as the uh, Malay Declaration on uh, Prevention and Control of Air Pollution and its likely transboundary effects on, on in South Asia. So um, um, there are eight member countries of this declaration. Um, um, start from Bangladesh, uh, Bhutan, Nepal, India, Pakistan, Maldives, Sri Lanka, and Iran. Um, the main objectives of the Malay Declaration was or is still uh, to provide a or to promote a process of providing clean environment through clean air. Um, I would like to say here that this was the first intergovernmental regional cooperation framework in Asia, even earlier than the, the ENET. Uh, which focused on air pollution in South Asia, uh, basically in Asia. So each member countries of the Malay Declaration has nominated the national focal points and national, national implementing agencies. And similar to uh, other intergovernmental network, the IG intergovernmental meeting is the main decision-making body, which decided uh, the, the activities to be implemented and financial uh, related matters. So um, the activities of the Malay Declaration has been implemented in phases. And I would like to really happy to uh, inform you that we have completed six phase of the Malay Declaration and now working on the seventh phase. Um, the initial phases of the Malay Declaration was focused on compiling the uh, baseline studies of the uh, member countries and then make a action plans to address or to tackle the air pollution. The um, later phases were focused on building the uh, capacity of the member countries on the air quality monitoring 
and analysis and then also the the helping the countries to establish the monitoring network in in their countries um also the later phase was um we uh, included the development of emission inventories um conducting the uh, air quality modeling studies and impact assessment studies and and help helping the government to to um to um, um adopt some of the recommendation which declaration the meetings make in the, in their policy so um uh, and also uh, during this period um every country was uh, designated as a regional center for a specific objective for a specific uh, activities um although we are now evaluating the performance of these centers and we are trying to reorganize the the centers uh, according to our um current uh, demand and situation so last uh, during two decades uh, mala declaration made a significant progress in terms of uh, promoting regional cooperation on air pollution and its transboundary aspects uh, building national capacities on air quality monitoring um conducting impact assessment studies um assisting the countries in policy making process and sharing sharing the experience and, and information um i i would like to say here that most many countries of the uh, this mala declaration they have acknowledged the the contribution that the declaration or the network make in their policy making process which is very uh, very welcome or very good um, feedback from the countries for the mala declaration um especially they were very happy to uh, that they the uh, the mala declaration make the uh, national capacity building so um i'm happy to share that till now we have organized a 16 session of intergovernmental meeting um 18 regional and national stakeholder meeting uh 15 regional and national capacity building programs and eight working group or task force meeting which uh for the specific of uh, specific uh, uh, purpose which the, the task force meeting were organized um i'd like to men uh, add here uh initially for more than 10 years um swedish international development cooperation agency that is sida uh provided fund to the mala declaration uh but it the fund was ended sometime in uh, in 2012 or 13 so in uh 12th session of the intergovernmental meeting which was organized in 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 2011 the countries had agreed to um to uh, agreed to make a sustainable financial mechanism um to provide the uh funding support to uh mala declaration secretariat uh based on the un uh based uh, based on the un scale burden sharing uh so i'm i'm really happy to uh, share that the the countries are uh contributing to mala but of course not enough but uh the 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 is this, this there is a uh, this uh, financial support provide a sustainability to the declaration Uh, i'd like to mention here especially india which is which provide the support to mala declaration but it was really must needed and it um, we by their um, um, the support the the secretary is still sustained so um before we conclude i just like to mention some more points uh, as we know the country uh, asian countries including the uh, mala declaration countries have gone through a tremendous changes and challenges in terms of socio economic development and as a result there are many emerging issues and challenges um these are interlinked like air pollution is closely linked with climate change human health um energy production and urban development um therefore the countries the priority of the countries has changed significantly over the last two decades so we are making a sincere efforts to revise the declaration and relaunch it uh for that we have developed a vision paper in which we have highlighted revised objectives um tentative structure and implementation strategy um of the relaunched mala declaration uh the draft of the um vision paper was already discussed in the working group meeting 
uh, held in June 2022. Uh, so and also the the work plan and strategy has already um, approved by the countries. So uh, the revised work plan and strategy has nine objectives and thirty eight activities. Uh, the strategy and work plan emphasize on promoting regional cooperation among countries and providing assistance on air quality monitoring, emission inventory development, air quality modeling, impact assessment, policy guidance and partnership building with the relevant international organizations. The draft of the strategy and work plan has been discussed in the working group meeting organized uh, in April 2021, and later it was approved at the 16th session of the intergovernmental meeting organized in January 2022. Uh, it is also uh, felt necessary to revise the two decade old declaration as the socioeconomic and environmental conditions have changed significantly in the member countries. So a draft of agreement has been prepared to focus to change the needs and priorities of the countries uh, with changing socioeconomic and environmental conditions and exploring opportunities for building partnership with international organizations to mobilize financial resources. The draft of agreement was discussed and reviewed during the working group meeting organized on June 2022. And now we are consulting with uh, countries for signing the agreement. Uh, very soon we will organize a next session of IG where these countries are um, may sign this agreement. So um, before I conclude, um, to implement, to improve the implementation of the Mali Declaration, we expect uh, an active role from the international organizations, including the UNEP and CCAC, uh, to play a good role or an important role in stabilizing or uh, make the sustainability of the Mali Declaration. So thank you, Kevin. Thank you very much, Lena. So I think you underlined the importance of having a, a sort of an institutional intergovernmental home. So you have the South Asian Cooperative Environment Program. Um, and it's really heartening to know that when the donor money from Sweden dried up, then the countries were able to step in and, and keep the process going. And I think as we move forward now, it'd be interesting to see if if the region can embrace the co-benefits for climate change and air pollution as it moves forward, as we as we know in this room that this is an important aspect. And it'd be interesting to see how that works out. So thank you very much. So now we move to the uh, the, the the longest running um, convention, and I'd like to introduce to you Sela um, Drokeok, who is an administrator in the Carbon Finance Unit in the Ministry of Environment in Moldova, and uh, you're going to talk to us about the LERTAP Convention, which is the Long Range Transboundary Air Pollution Convention across Europe and North America. So the floor is yours. Mm -hmm. Thank you very much for inviting us here and bringing uh, us from daily routine. We cannot do very much separately. Uh, we would not be confident in what we do. The climate and the clean air coalitions is the only treat, treaty that emphasize uh, the air quality without which we cannot live or we cannot live well and healthily. So um, also uh, air quality conditions climate change the development partners and donors do not consider this as a climate aspect available for climate funds. And it is very difficult for us to find financing for recovery air quality. We are glad that was created the Climate and Clean Air Coalition, where we discuss air-related issues and find solutions for uh, regarding funds and other. Mainly, I would like to mention about our regional cooperation within the Convention of Long-Range Transboundary Air Pollution. Under this uh, convention, the parties uh, commit themselves to work together to limit, to gradually prevent and to reduce the discharge of air pollutants in order to combat and uh, the resulting transboundary pollutions. Republic of Moldova joint LERTAP, so named LERTAP convention in 1995. Uh, and from 
eight protocols of the convention. Republic of Moldova signed uh, four uh, protocols and ratified on uh, three of them, uh, which are protocol of heavy metals, protocol on persistent organic pollutants, protocol uh, on the monitoring and evaluation program for longer range transboundary of air pollutants. And we need to put efforts to ratify the Göteborg Protocol about acidification, eutrophication, and ground, ground level ozone. Main commitments um, for country uh, parts to let up convention consist on nomenclature for reporting of 25 uh, air pollutants, uh, including three short-lived climate pollutants as, as uh, ozone tropospheric, hydrofluorocarbons, black carbon, and PMs. Also, informative um, uh, inventory report is submitted uh, annually in March. Grid emission report and um, emission projections. The importance of cooperation within the LERTAP Convention consists on the compilation of national reports and making the entire picture of emission inventory at the regional level. The delay in the reporting of a country leads to, to the postponement of emissions estimate at the regional level. In this way, the convention is putting the accent on the institutional and individual capacity development. Republic of Moldova needs to improve the import, uh, in, uh, re reporting. We are cooperating with Stockholm Environment Institute, which is focused on science, policy, and practice to help gov government uh, improving the reporting. So national experts are learning the LIP IBC tool for emission projections, facilitating the policy development, estimating the adequate measures contributing to the emission decreasing. Besides of monitoring, uh, uh, inventory, we need to put accent of monitoring aspect of uh, air quality, establishing national air quality monitoring network. Currently, in the Republic of Moldova, monitoring is performed by 70 um, monitoring stations installed about 50 years ago. So, but le last year, in cooperation with the government of Germany, the AOA installed the first monitoring traffic stations, which are monitoring online five air pollutants. Now, in cooperation with Meteo France International, we are discussing to purchase the 18 new station monitoring station for an integrated environmental monitoring. So, also, I am glad to mention about, about our cooperation with Asia, uh, Asia um, region, especially with Japan. The Republic of Moldova has signed the memorandum of joint crediting mechanism, which is a financial mechanism under the Article 6 of the Paris um, Agreement. So, uh, finally, I would like to underline that it is very important for CCIC to engage and explore collaborative opportunities and resources where government, private sectors and non-profit acts uh, within the spirit of multi-stakeholders to solve the multiple crisis, crisis of air pol uh, pollution and climate change. Together, we can do the best. Thank you. Thank you very much, Sarah. And it's, it's good to hear the progress that you're making ratifying the protocols and moving towards the Gothenburg multi pollutant multi effect protocol. Uh, but you underlined really the, you know, the real need for us to address financing to, to move the, these networks forward. So that's something that has been raised this morning already, but it's a really key issue. And then, you know, you mentioned the bread and butter of the LERTAP convention, which is the monitoring. So it all started around monitoring. So it's really good that that's carrying on with your network. And the importance of reporting and, and um, you know, communicating what you're finding. So thank you very much for sharing your experience. So the last in this little section, and so we've got two more speakers keeping you from lunch, but we give them a fair hearing, I think. Um, so Bidia, um, I've also had the privilege of working with um, uh, Bidia um, Banmali uh, Pradhan, who's um, from Izumod, which is the international um, 
the International Centre for Integrated Mountain Development, which is based in uh, Kathmandu in Nepal. And um, she's been working in the uh, in what they call the third pole, which is the third pole of the cryosphere. So uh, the floor is yours, Bidya, to share your experience of Vizimod. Thank you. <coughs> Thank you, Kevin. Firstly, um, uh, for those who don't know about my organization, it's an uh, in independent intergovernmental organization working in the Hindu Kush Himalayan region. That means like we have eight member countries. Um, out of um, uh, like uh, six from the South Asia, excluding Myanmar and uh, excluding uh, Maldives and Sri Lanka. And additionally, we have two other member countries like China and Myanmar. So uh, these makes the eight regional member countries. So regarding this, uh, um, about the air pollution, it was Mali declaration who was able to spur discussion in 1998 about the air quality issues in the region. So actually that was the first when we started uh, discussing, but since then a lot of changes have been hap uh, happened in the scenario. Uh, Previously, I should say, like the shift is now, you know, it's not only the environment problem, it's taken as the development problem also. So most of the national government from various uh, um, sector um, uh, communities like the health sector, the local government, um, everybody is uh, collaborating and talking about air pollution. And uh, the second is, you know, when we started um, uh, uh, 20 years back, there was no much monitoring station except India and a few other countries. But now uh, each of the South Asian countries have this monitoring and that also in the real time. So that is one of the improvements that we are seeing. And even the media is becoming very engaged that we get a lot of media coverage and sometimes we also get, uh, get to see in the front page of the media about the air pollution issues. And of course, you know, there's a lot of investment from the private sector, not only the investment, but also the engagement through the private sectors. And um, South Asia in the region and Hindu Kush, the most of the policy issues, like P the government are also looking at the policy issues. For example, uh, for India, they have this NCAP, which uh, they have also pumped in a lot of money and they are working in the 100 cities and uh, more um, stringent emission standards are placed in Nepal, India, also in Pakistan. So these are changes are happening in this um, uh, front. And also we have the technological solution. Yesterday we heard about the 10, 25 solutions that uh, CCAC has already put forward. And, uh, you know, we didn't have um, organization like CCAC before. Now we have organization like CCAC where we are able to learn and share experience um, about and talk about air pollution, what is happening globally. Uh, and we heard about, uh, you know, a lot of finance has been also pumped into uh, this sector. Uh, yesterday, we heard from a ADP, like, you know, it's about not only about millions, it's uh, they are talking about billions. Similarly, you know, uh, talking about um, cross-boundary cooperation. Um, why we need, because everybody knows like air pollution does not respect national boundaries. So we need to work uh, together, collaboratively, uh, collaboratively to solve this problem. Because, you know, I mean, um, though Himalayan uh, countries like Nepal, Bhutan are pristine, but still, you know, we are uh, facing severe catastrophe from ice and snow melting that has downward impact like, you know, a lot of disaster events, agriculture <clears throat> events, and then, you know, problems. And then also, you know, a lot of other uh, different problems and water supply is also happening. So unless like, you know, we uh, work together, uh, we cannot act, uh, you know, alone. We need to collaborate in this sense. So, I mean, one is Mali declaration in the region and uh, talking about the Indo-Gangetic Plains. When we are talking about Indo-Gangetic Plains, that's the most, uh, you know, populated region of South Asia. And when we are seeing that, you saw that, you know, there are 
out of 40 most polluted cities, 37 are in South Asia. So we really need to act now and uh, collab uh, collaborate. And um, also it's from the public health uh, point, it's like a public, we saw the presentation yesterday that a lot of health impacts and people are dying of air pollution. So uh, we need to act towards that. And uh, moreover, you know, this IGP planes are, um, uh, in short, it's uh, called IGP for intergalactic planes. They're also geopolitically very challenging. But somehow, like, you know, EC mode is also working towards it, how we could collaborate not only on all, not only in air pollution, but all, all other environmental aspects. So um, the last December, um, uh, we um, had this uh, science policy dialogue. Uh, EC mode and World Bank has engaged in this science policy dialogue. Um, also to build in the rich history that we already have, like, you know, Mali Declaration, and also understanding the importance of regional collaboration, uh, the government representatives from Bangladesh, India, Nepal, and Pakistan um, signed Kathmandu Declaration. Um, but uh, it's called IGP and Himalayan foothills. So we have included Bhutan and Nepal as the Himalayan foothills as well. So um, this in this declaration that uh, mainly three things uh, we have been focusing. One is starting with the data. M many uh, of the speakers in the panel also uh, uh, stated the importance of the data and also how to develop a, a framework for systematic improvement of air quality data and not only developing, but also generating uh, a creditable, creditable data, which is compar uh, comparable, you know, because, you know, we have uh, very much geopolitically uh, challenging countries. So we, it has to be comparable, like, you know, within these countries so that we cannot blame one another and we cannot point fingers. It has to be evidence-based data so that we need to work on it. And not only that, but once we collect the data, we need to build a capacity to analyze them. So that is the institutional capacity building that we are working. And the second is establishing joint targets to track emissions within and across countries. Uh, and uh, we case. encourage to adopt Maybe. yeah, effective solutions. And this could include sharing experience in tackling the, the sources of air pollutions like we have in the region, open burning, brick cleanse, vehicle emissions. And the third point, it's about to finish. It's like regularly meeting, you know, having this science policy dialogue, like we are meeting regularly, like in CCAC meeting for sharing uh, about the air quality management, policy experience, monitoring efforts, also technological solutions, and also implementing challenges. And uh, EC mode also organizes ministerial summit once in two years. And, you know, these issues can be taken up in the, in this ministerial summit so that, you know, there's a regional initiative and policy harmonization across the region. And moreover, there's a ownership by each country so that we can work together. Thank you. I'll stop here. Thank you very much, Bidya, and sorry to pressurise you, but the, uh, we're going to be really unpopular otherwise, eating into lunchtime. So, yeah, the importance of the Malay Declaration and declarations like it bring on the issue. And, you know, it's very encouraging to hear that funders are starting to turn their head in, in, in your direction. And then the very big importance of, you know, tackling those geopolitical issues by dialogue. That's really key. So thank you very much. And then finally... I know like, we're keeping you from lunch, but uh, I hope you, you see these people out because we've got some good messages for you. So we turn to Rennie again that you've heard from before, Rennie Gift. So could I turn to you just to say how, your perspective about, you know, the legislation, how that could feed yeah, into... I mean, I, I think most colleagues on the panel have touched on some of the main issues. Um, but just to say that, you know, it, as I showed in my, from my research um, in the Global Assessment Report, only 31% of the countries had legislation that supported transboundary pollution. And 66% of those parties were parties to the Convention on Long-Range Transboundary Air Pollution. 
So countries can do a lot by uh, to to manage transboundary air, air pollution within their own countries, working on their own national legislation. And that's it from my side. Brilliant. So in that way, they can act as like champions for the for the cause and and uh, sort of catalyze the whole situation. Thank you very much for your patience. I'm sorry I went a bit over, but if you give a warm welcome, a um, warm round of applause to the. Uh, and uh, now, now Martina can breathe again. <laughs> <laughs> no, fantastic. Thank you very much to our panel. Thank you, Kevin. Um, very good. And uh, two announcements uh, quickly. Uh, as I said, the Africa session will be in this room um, right after lunch. The Asia session will be in the room that was originally foreseen for the Africa, uh, Africa one in conference room F. And uh, I made the announcement for the meet uh, Rob Wing, um, talking about the resolution that could be at 3.45 in room F. Um, so I think with that, uh, bon appétit. <laughs> And if on your way out there, you can pass by the uh, booth and so on and downstairs to exhibit as well. Uh, I think they've put in a lot of effort to, to showcase something that's interesting and should hopefully be interesting to all of you. Thank you. Yeah.